Muy buenos días, señoras y señores. Me agrada mucho poder darle la bienvenida a LSE. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to LSE. My name is Jan-Klan Heisterkamp. I'm in the law department here since about 11 years, and it's a great pleasure and an honor to welcome all of you to this symposium in honor of uh, Professor Francisco, Francisco Orrego Vicuña. I had the pleasure personally to meet him a long time ago when I was a PhD student and I was writing my dissertation on arbitration in the countries of the Mercosur and the associated countries, which at the time Chile still was. And um, I traveled Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, and Brazil in uh, search of practitioners who had actual experience with the subject. And um, I knew a lot of people in Brazil and in Argentina of which very few had actual experience with arbitration. I knew hardly anyone in Chile, except through my old uh, mentor, Dr. Sandleben, who knew Francisco Rego very well, and who had given me his address and said, just start with him and you will, you will find your way in Chile. And um, so there I was, um, a young uh, PhD student who had difficulties understanding the Chilean accent, coming from Argentina. <laughs> And I was afraid of the interviews I had to do, but after two days, my brain had adapted. And uh, so one of the first encounters was with uh, Professor Rego Vicuña, and he very graciously and grateful, uh, uh, generously um, welcomed me and gave me a lot of very good, helpful hints, advice, and connections. Uh, and this generosity, which I experienced, I think is something that many of you who knew him will, have, uh, will relate to. Um, I, I, I have a very dear memory of, of, his, uh, of his generosity and kindness. Um, I will not say many words because we have so many eminent speakers. Uh, we actually have an eminent audience as well. This is a very special event. And the LSE Law Department is very happy to host this event. And uh, I just want to say, uh, Rosalind Higgins will say some words also about uh, uh, Professor Orrego's uh, arrival here at London and his time here, where he was, of course, uh, ambassador. Uh, and um, I thought, going through the files of LSE, I found a nice letter of recommendation, which was written for him so that he could be accepted as a PhD student at the time. And it is by Professor von Klabren. Um, just give me a minute to read this out. As you may already know, Professor Francisco Rego is not a conventional and typical applicant to a PhD program at the LSE or any similar institution, not so much because of his present diplomatic position, which in itself does not reflect necessarily an appropriate academic level, but because of his academic and professional achievements in the field of international law and during the last years, international relations. In fact, Francisco Rego has already made a particularly successful career as a senior legal advisor at the Organization of American States, as professor of international law at the University of Chile, as director of the Institute of International Studies at the same university during a period of 10 very fruitful years, as a Chile negotiator in several rather complex international issues, and as a guest scholar at the institutions like the International Law Academy at The Hague, Stanford University, and others. In view of his most distinguished career, I am certain that Professor Rego will not only prove to be an exceptional PhD student at LSE, but will also make a substantial contribution in the field he has chosen. His numerous publications in several languages, his reputation as one of the best Latin American experts in topics such as the law of the seas, his task as director of one of the most active and, according to objective sources, prestigious and pluralist centers of international studies in Latin America, and his abilities as a flexible and informed negotiator allow to make this particular positive assessment of the applicant's suitability to the degree in question. Of course, when Francisco Rego came to LSE, he had already published 20 books, <laughs> six of which were actually written by himself entirely. The others were edited collections with his contributions. Um, I think that gives you a nice, over, uh, you know, picture of what kind of PhD student he was. Um, 
he was dispensed, uh, or he got a dispense from having to pass first the MPhil, the first degree before being able to enter the doctorate, which I think was appropriate. And he was also dispensed from serving a third year as a PhD student because he was already done after two years. The, the mandatory period was three years, but very exceptionally, the school accepted that since he was called back to Chile, two years would be enough. In two years, he produced this. This is his PhD, published afterwards with Cambridge University Press, the Antarctic Mineral Exploration, the Merging Legal Framework. 526 pages in two years while being ambassador in London is a remarkable achievement. Of course, he was building on his previous works and had already published on the subject and therefore made a really important contribution to the subject. With no further ado, I will pass on to our first, no, sorry, we're going to first have the welcome also of the ambassador from Chile, and I'm delighted that you're here with us, as well as the Orego family, of course, which um, is a pleasure to, to have you all here. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Well, it's a great honor and pleasure to, uh, to be here as ambassador of Chile, a, a successor, I'm not sure a worthy one, but a successor of uh, Francisco as ambassador to the United Kingdom, to welcome you today to this symposium to celebrate the life and legacy of Francisco Rego Vicuña. Um, today is the first anniversary of his passing. We have all been working uh, uh, on this for a while now, and I want to make some acknowledgements, if I, if I may. Soon after Francisco passed away, I received a visit from his former pupil and assistant, Paz Sarate, with, with the suggestion that we celebrate Francisco's life, life and legacy with a memorial service and a symposium. At the embassy, we thought it was a great idea. In fact, it was a no-brainer. Francisco was a great jurist and well-known around the world, and in Chile, we were, we were extraordinarily proud of him. Paz has been tireless in the organization of everything, and she's made us work very hard at the embassy, too. My thanks there, especially to Francisco Tello, my colleague with, whom we put in charge of the, of the project and has worked tirelessly for, for this. From the moment that Paz visited us, this homage to Francisco became a priority for our embassy, but it was a substantial enterprise and we couldn't do it on our own. We needed help. To that end, we solicited and gained the enthusiastic support of Carolina Valdivia, our Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, herself a trained international law specialist of Ambassador Jimena Fuentes, head of the National Department of State Borders and Boundaries, DIFROL, of Ambassador Maria Teresa Infante, our envoy to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and of Amb Ambassador Octavio uh, Erasuris, our envoy at the Vatican. Alas, Vice Minister Valdivia and Ambassador Erasuris have not been able to join us today, but have happily Ambassador Fuentes and Ambassador Infante, whose distinguished professors of international law were Francisco's colleagues, are present here. My heartfelt thanks to all of these colleagues from our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But this has also been a public-private enterprise involving many other parties, to whom I'm enormously grateful, without whom we, we would not be here. The Department of Law of the London School of Economics and Political Science, of course, where Francisco earned his doctorate, as described by Jan. Our special thanks to Professor Jan klein Hasterkamp, assisted by Agustin Sell, Chilean International Relations Specialist and LSE graduate. Heartfelt thanks to Jan Agustin and the LSE community for being such generous hosts for this gathering. Then, Heidelberg University Center for Latin America, in which Francisco was very much involved, 
particularly in the last two decades of his academic career, represented here today by its director, Dr. Walter Eckel, and coordinator, Andrea Lucas. The international law firm, Baker Botts, LLP, represented by partner Alejandro Escobar, Francisco, former student and great friend, so steady in his support from day one in every aspect of these events. The Bahrain Chamber of Dispute Resolution, represented by its Chief Executive Officer, Nasib Ziadeh, Francisco's work was well appreciated in the Middle East and he sat on the BCDR Advisory Council. And like Alejandro, Nasib was also one of Francisco's dearest friends. Carlos Cáceres, whose late daughter was married to Francisco's son, and finally, Jorge Gabriela Raín from Chile, whose sister was married to Francisco's late brother, Claudio. To all of the above, thank you for your enthusiasm, your hard work, and your incredible generosity. I was lucky to know Francisco well. I greatly admired his wisdom, his intellectual depth and breadth, his kindness. When before becoming ambassador, I was an investment banker, often advising foreign invest investors into Chile. I could not but admire Francisco's pioneering work on cross-border investment dispute resolution. Now, as ambassador, I am in awe of his work on the Antarctic and the law of the sea. It so happens that this year in Chile, we are holding COP25, the climate change gathering. Our intention is to focus in particular on the sea. It will be a blue COP and on the Antarctic. What could be more apposite than Francisco's work for this now? What better testament could there be to the vision that he developed so ahead of his time? I now leave it to you to enjoy today's symposium. Thank you very much. Excellencies, um, Maria Soledad's family, um, Ambassador Infante, Vice President of the ICJ, Judge Shui, other distinguished guests, um, good morning um, to you all. Um, if any of you have some spare sunglasses for us <laughs> up here, please do pass them up. This was something I think none of us anticipated, particularly after the heavens opened during, um, or at least at the beginning of the very beautiful Requiem uh, Mass uh, yesterday um, at St. James uh, Church. Um, the ambassador uh, said during his really wonderful address where, if I may say so, he caught the essence of our friend Francisco. He said he was speaking from uh, two perspectives, um, a personal friend and the ambassador of his country to talk about that side of the many wonderful things that Francisco had done. Um, I feel I'm also here in a dual capacity as uh, a friend and um, as uh, representing the Institut de Droit International, um, who sent their warm greetings for this occasion. Our speakers today um, are not entirely as was originally anticipated in the sense that uh, Lady Fox, Hazel Fox, was to have been among our number. Um, 
she has not felt able uh, to uh, attend and we will miss her though she sends her best wishes but we've been very fortunate in that uh, Jean-Marc Touvenin uh, now essentially running the Hague Academy um, has kindly agreed to say um, a few words on Francisco and that topic uh, during our uh, panel. I was the professor here at LSE um, at the time um, that Francisco uh, came. This is a sensitive topic. What was easy, as Ambassador Gallagher has said, was the quality of the man uh, applying to be admitted to a PhD. Uh, but the reality of history perhaps requires us to remember uh, that the years 83 to 85, when Francisco was ambassador, were particularly difficult years in your country. LSE had the reputation, which has never been quite correct, of being a left-wing institution, those of us who have uh, worked here have always thought of it as a rather open institution. And one of the pleasures of being here was that we could uh, listen frequently uh, to debates between uh, academics of quite opposing views to which the students and we, the staff, would go and listen with pleasure to these animated debate through which existed personal friendships. For me, that's the essence of LSE. Nonetheless, uh, it was a tricky moment when I, who had not been here so very long, um, I believe I arrived uh, two or three years beforehand, was uh, asked by Francisco, um, mighty while he was here as ambassador, be admitted to do a PhD, of course, in his beloved area of law of the sea and resources. Um, I was greatly helped by the fact that first this was a very distinguished application and secondly we were able to say with hands on heart what an exceptional and uh, splendid person this was who would absolutely fit into the open-mindedness of the LSE and eventually after some little internal hiccups uh, the admission was accomplished. Uh, I uh, asked Dr. Patricia Burney, who some of you here will remember, if she would take on the supervision of his uh, doctorate. And uh, she and he really became an item. They were everywhere to be seen at every meeting, every gathering, every meal in the school. They became the closest of friends, and it is only sad that Pat Burney, um, who has passed on, can't be with us today. She had already written a, bo a book with Alan Boyle, um, from whom you'll hear later, on environmental or a very early book in the field. So it was a perfect uh, pairing. And you can see from his extraordinary list of publications that not only um, his first book, which has been held to show you in Ambassador Gallagher's hands, uh, not only that, but subsequent publications that followed on rapidly, especially with Cambridge University Press drew very much on his time at LSE. 
and I just want to say he was very popular here. You are in the right place for this seminar. He joined in everything, was respected and liked here. Now, uh, of course, uh, we know uh, that uh, Francisco was a renowned and respected professor at the University of Santiago de Chile, and he took an active part in international arbitration, was a judge ad hoc at the International Court of Justice, but he had this, in addition to that, this exceptional academic uh, qualifications. Uh, really, his CV is quite extraordinary uh, to read. And now, putting on for a moment my ASTI2 hat, I would like to tell you that he became, as is required, we have two steps at the ASTI2, he became an associate in 1991 at the Baal session. I remember that session very well because when I and my husband arrived there, we went to the window and we saw what appeared to be bodies floating down the river. But in fact, that is the nature of the heavy current there and swimmers just get in and let themselves be carried <laughs> from one place to another. It was very alarming at first sight. And Francisco became a, a full member um, at the 1997 uh, session in Strasbourg. He was a very active member. He was a rapporteur of the Commission on Responsibility and the Environment, whose work led to an important resolution being adopted on responsibility and liability under international law for environmental damage. That was at the Strasbourg session. Being a rapporteur is a great deal of heavy work and as if that was not enough. He participated in a remarkably wide number of commissions. Most of us who've been rapporteurs are very happy to do three or four more commissions to help with those, but not for Francisco. He participated in the Commission on the Role and Significance of Consensus, in the framing of international law, on humanitarian assistance, on universal criminal jurisdiction with respect to the crime of genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. He was on the commission of the position of the international judge, the legal aspects of recourse to arbitration by an investor in interstate treaties, and the hot topic of judicial review of Security Council decisions. And at the time he passed away, he was still an active Commission member in the Commission on Jurisprudence and Precedence in International Law. And of course his work uh, in the Institute uh, culminated in his being a president when the Institute held its session um, at Santiago. This was the very first time the Institute had ever had a session in Latin America. The organization there is to this day regarded as exemplary and being president, I want to explain, is not titular. It involves two years of extremely hard work uh, joining with the staff of the Institute to prepare the forthcoming session. And as we would expect, it was all done in a marvelous way. Well, we're now ready, I think, to begin our uh, panel. 
Uh, the panel is on the rather general theme, um, Professor Arego Vicuna, the development of international law. And uh, you can see from uh, the CV uh, with which Mr. Escobar has kindly provided us that Francisco, while never leaving his beloved law of the sea and environmental area, developed interests of quite extraordinary breadth. He knew, he wrote, as we've heard already, 20 books. In, there were all the ICSID arbitrations, in many of which he was president. There was his time as ad hoc judge at the ICJ. There was his time at the Hague Academy. No wonder this man, whose energy seemed tireless, uh, could and did indeed contribute to the development of international law. So we'll start with this general panel and move towards uh, more specific panels as uh, the day goes on. And first of all, we'll hear from Sir Christopher Greenwood, who I'm sure everyone here knows, currently a judge at the Iran US Tribunal and a very um, active uh, arbitrator. Sir Christopher. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm, I'm tempted, uh, sorry, let me begin properly. Excellencies, members of the family, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Um, I have to remind myself of that because the sun is shining so brightly in our eyes that I cannot actually recognize anyone out there. And indeed, I'm not actually sure that there is anyone out there. Um, it's rather like the, the very first time I acted as an external examiner for an Oxford DPhil, having been told that I had to wear my full academic robes because this was a public event. I was then shown into a windowless basement room with a single light hanging from the ceiling, which dazzled everyone, three wooden upright chairs, and a tiny table. To be quite honest, a hardened KGB interrogator might have thought it was a tad austere. <laughs> so forgive me if I don't recognize anyone, and forgive me if I, I blink periodically. It, it is a great pleasure and an honor to be asked to take part in this seminar and to pay tribute to my friend and, and colleague, uh, Francisco Orego Vicuña. To talk about his contribution to the development of international law has to span such a wide range of activity. He was a scholar, a teacher, a diplomat, a judge, an arbitrator. And I'll say something about some of those professional attributes in a moment. But before I do that, I want to pay tribute to two other qualities that he had, which are all too often sadly lacking in our world today. The first is that he approached everything he did with tremendous courtesy and kindness. He was never one who made the mistake of thinking that controversy or strongly held opinions justified being rude or abrasive with people. Even when he didn't agree with you, he always disagreed in a friendly and pleasant way. I've never forgotten that in uh, 1999, when I was involved in the litigation about General Pinochet in the House of Lords, in the second hearing of that case, um, the Republic of Chile intervened, and Francisco, I think, was there as an advisor to the delegation. And he came up to me in the uh, lunch break of the first day, slapped me on the shoulder and said, Oh, Christopher, what have you done? What have you done? <laughs> the second quality I'd like to pay tribute to is that Francisco had judgment, real judgment. And all too often today, we tend to think of somebody's worth as an international lawyer in terms of their understanding of the law, their scholarship, and we neglect the fact that particularly when you are dealing with somebody who is sitting as a judge or as an arbitrator, it's not enough to know international law inside out. It's not enough to have wonderful and original ideas. You have to have a sense of how to apply them, a streak of common sense, judgment, empathy, an ability to get inside what is actually going on in the case. And Francisco Orego Vicuña had that. 
It's one of my great sadnesses that I never actually sat with him in a case. I didn't sit in the Peru and Chile case in the International Court of Justice when he was an ad hoc judge because I had advised the government of Chile on that case shortly before I was nominated uh, for election to the International Court. It was one of the cases where I had to recuse myself. I've never forgotten that one of my first visitors when I went to the court was the ambassador of Peru to The Hague, who had clearly come to make sure that I was going to do the decent thing and recuse myself voluntarily rather than embarrass his government. So I was able to put his mind at rest. And then this time last year, a little bit earlier than this time last year, uh, I was picked to chair an arbitration tribunal of which Francisco Orego was one of the members. And I was very much looking forward to sitting with him when out of the blue we suddenly received an email saying he was going to have to resign for reasons of ill health and then sadly he died shortly afterwards. <coughs> uh, we will miss him very much in the world of international law and all its different manifestations. Now turning to his contribution to the development of international law, when we talk about somebody's contribution to the development of international law, all too often we think of that in terms of somebody's work on a grand projet. Is there a treaty to which they have given their name? Is there a piece of legislation that everyone associates with them? Is there some grand new theory that someone, everyone associates with that person? Or we think of it in terms of crusading cause advocacy, somebody who is always trying to mould the law to a particular set of goals. I don't want to decry any of that. But I don't think it is how international law is actually developed in practice, particularly if your role is that of judge or arbitrator. I think much more important is not the grand edifice, but the steady building up, brick by brick, of the foundations and the structure of international law. It calls for intellectual rigor. It calls for integrity, a willingness to recognize that sometimes the law is not as you would like it to be, but has to be applied with integrity in any event. And I think that is very much what Francisco Arrego always did. Now, since my colleagues on this panel are well-placed to speak about different aspects of his scholarship and his work as an academic, I'm going to concentrate on his work as a judge and an arbitrator. Now, here you are picking from a very large field. If he authored 20 books, he authored at least twice as many arbitration awards and separate opinions. I just want to pick three as an example. And it's worth keeping in mind here that all of these come from the sphere of international litigation of one kind or another. International litigation is not a straightforward matter. Um, all too often it resembles one critic's description of a performance of Wagner's Ring. Wonderful moments, terrible quarters of hours, and at the end of this magnificent performance, it looks as though the whole place is on fire. And you've often lost interest in whether it's on fire or not. You don't really care anymore. It requires keeping an overall view of what is going on, rather than just becoming enmeshed in one particular aspect. And that, I think, was another of Francisco Arrego's strengths. Because if you look across the sphere of what he did, he was never a narrow specialist. You only have to look at the topics that uh, our chair has just identified. Look at the subjects of the awards he gave. Look at the books and articles that he wrote to realize that he ranged across the whole of international law. And that, I think, is critical. All too often, those who set out to develop international law wish to develop one little bit of it, and they lose sight of everything else. They are human rights lawyers who know nothing of the law of treaties. They are environmentalists who know nothing of the law of state responsibility. Francisco Orego never made that mistake in everything that I have ever seen of his writing, whether as a judge or as a scholar. He was somebody who could take in the breadth of international law and see how its different bits and pieces joined up. Now, the three examples I want to give, the first is the Letelier and Moffat dispute between the United States and the families of Letelier and Moffat on the one side, and the Republic of Chile on the other. You remember, I'm sure, that Letelier was assassinated in Washington, D.C. One of those killed with him was an American national, Ronnie Moffitt. There was litigation in the United States courts, and then at the end, a commission set up by the two governments to look into the question of compensation. 
It's a tribute to all concerned that they produced a unanimous result. It's a tribute to all concerned that they produced a unanimous result. But it's worth looking at Francisco's separate opinion, which is emphatic about the importance of remedies and reparation in international law. It was emphatic that this, was, this case was, in his rather remarkable phrase, not an infringement of the sovereignty of Chile, which is how it had been seen by some, but rather an exercise of Chile's sovereignty. It was because Chile exercised that sovereignty that it was a party to those proceedings. He also dealt with a particular um, hobby horse of mine, which is to attack the idea of punitive damages as something which had no part in international law. That is something which I think it is well worth our while to remember. The second case that I refer to briefly is a much more controversial one, the Maffetzini Award. Maffetzini, of course, was the case that invented the idea, or developed from next to nowhere, the idea that the most favored nation clause in a bilateral investment treaty could be used not only to expand the range of substantive principles applicable, but also to expand the jurisdiction of a tribunal. It's given rise to a huge literature, a vast body of uh, arbitral jurisprudence, sadly, very heavily divided. There are many who think it's a marvelous idea, others who think it's iniquitous. I was once asked if I would chair an arbitration tribunal where the two party-nominated arbitrators, one of them was of one school who thought that most favored nation clauses could be used to do anything, Another was of the school that thought they could never, under any circumstances, expand the jurisdiction of a tribunal. I, I declined the offer of the chairmanship because we were too busy at the ICJ for me to take it on. Um, but I did think, in hindsight, if I had done it, the only way to have emerged with honor would have been to have written an opinion which both the party nominees dissented from on one ground or another. And I, I think on the whole, I, I tend towards the skeptical about the use of the most favored nation clause as a means of enlarging the jurisdiction of a tribunal. But do look at the very cautious way in which the tribunal that Francisco chaired went about that in Maffetzini. The reasoning is strong. It's limited to a particular area of jurisdiction and the MFN clause. It's nothing like the open charter that some of the later cases turned it into. And it's very much the way in which somebody with intellectual rigor and professional integrity can work to develop the law in their own particular sphere. The third is his separate opinion in the Peru and Chile case. Now, as I have disclosed the fact that I advised the government of Chile about it, uh, it won't perhaps come as a surprise to you if I say that um, I wasn't wholly satisfied with the judgment that the court gave in that case. And one doesn't have to read it very carefully to realize that it's very plainly a compromise between different positions. But Francisco's separate opinion is not a frontal attack on the methodology or the outcome. It's a very sophisticated weighing of what he thought was right and what he would thought was open to criticism in the judgment. And I think it had an enormously valuable impact because whether or not you agree with the outcome in Peru and Chile, I think all of us who care about international law would take our hats off to the two governments for the fact that without trouble and without aggression between them, they came up with a working method for implementing the judgment within a matter of months of it being given. And without wishing to single out any specific cases by name, for it would be improper for me to do so, if you look at some of the other judgments given by the International Court in recent years, and the way in which the governments in question have gone about implementing them, or to be more accurate, not implementing them, both Peru and Chile come very well out of the subsequent phase, the wash-up phase of the Peru and Chile judgment. And for that, I think, some credit goes to Francisco Arrego for the very balanced way in which he wrote his separate opinion. It showed people in Chile what had, Chile had won in that case. All too often, 
the separate or dis usually the dissenting opinion of an ad hoc judge, merely rubs salt in the wounds of the state that feels it has lost and makes it more difficult rather than more straightforward for it to implement its obligations under the statute of the International Court. I'll leave it at that point, Madam Chair. It does seem to me that it is through that kind of slow, incremental work that international law is really developed. And that is the contribution that Francisco Arrego made and for which we all have very considerable reason to be grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris, and I now uh, call upon Sam Wordsworth, who is a silk in practice at Essex Court uh, Chambers. In fact, we're all an Essex Court Chambers team up here. Um, and uh, uh, Sam Wordsworth's practice is both in litigation and in arbitration, and he's become a familiar figure at the International Court of Justice. Sam. Thank you very, <coughs> thank you very much, Rosalind. <coughs> Excellencies, members of the family, ladies and gentlemen, it's always very difficult indeed to follow Sir Christopher, who has already so aptly identified all the very many excellent qualities of Francisco Orego Vacuña um, as a person and as a lawyer. Um, I've had the honor to appear before Francisco on various cases, uh, but today I have the privilege of having been asked to focus on uh, one of the many ticks on Francisco's long list of achievements, which is the Hirsch Lauterpacht lectures that he was asked to give in 2001 and that were published shortly afterwards in this uh, book, International Dispute Settlement in an Involving, Evolving Global Society. And for anyone in the audience who doesn't know quite what the Hirsch Lauterpax lectures are, uh, this is one of the most prestigious annual lecture events in the United Kingdom um, with past lecturers featuring a, a long list of international law superstars, um, including Sir Christopher to my left, and one could ask, where is Sir Christopher's equivalent of this uh, very wonderful publication? And, uh, and <laughs> looking around the audience, one can see other past Hirsch Lauterbach lecturers, this Sir Michael Wood, and one can ask of Sir Michael, where is the equivalent of this very helpful uh, publication? Um, and Hans Blix and Sir Arthur Watts and, and great, great names of the international law firmament. And the very fact that Francisco was asked to give the Hirsch Lauterbach lectures in 2001 is a reflection of the very, very high reputation uh, that he has on this side of the globe. Um, in fact, he was uh, thus far the first and only Chilean uh, to have been asked to give the Hirsch Lauterpacht lectures. Um, but it's very wonderful to see in this audience today some very distinguished Chilean jurists who I'm sure will in due course also be being uh, contacted to give these lectures. Now, the starting point uh, for Francisco in his lectures was a recognition and focus on the phenomenon of globalization. Um, he saw this as presenting a very particular set of challenges for international dispute settlement. And of course, he was looking at globalization as a phenomenon leading to uh, greater integration. Uh, but also, very interestingly, he saw it as leading towards uh, decentralization. And if I can take you very briefly to a short passage from uh, his lectures, he says, 
the diffusion of economic power and the prospective emergence of alternative centers of political power, the resurgence of religious influences in the conduct of both domestic and international affairs, the affirmation of cultural values and outbursts of nationalism are clear indications that globalization is conducive not only to centralization, but to decentralization as well. And when I read that, I thought that is extraordinarily apt because what we have been seeing in recent years is ab absolutely this resurgence of nationalism. And we see that filtering through and creating some very obvious challenges to international law so that we see uh, certain much loved uh, states and governments somehow pulling back from the system of international law. Obvious examples would be the US withdrawal from the Paris Agreement or the US response to the International Court of Justice's provisional measures order uh, in the Iran-US case of October 2018, where the United States elected to terminate or withdraw from the 1955 Treaty of Amity, which of course had been a bedrock uh, of relations between, um, or one of the few remaining bedrocks of relations uh, between uh, Iran and the USA since 1955. And of course, closer to home, we can see uh, also challenges being posed by increased nationalism. And one is looking on uh, with acute interest, but also acute concern to see how the UK is going to comply uh, with crystallized obligations that come out of the EU treaties in the event of a, a no deal Brexit. So against this backdrop of globalization, um, Francisco was noting how there had been what he called a vast normative expansion in international law. And there he focused on the growing uncertainty that was created by the, the normative expansion. And one can absolutely see uh, the validity of that. And we've seen that very much um, in the English courts and going through uh, to the Strasbourg courts in the example of where in an armed conflict, what are the different systems of law and the huge uncertainty uh, that states have faced when they've been um, troop contributing nations uh, to armed conflict in Afghanistan or in Iraq. Uh, the issue there, of course, international humanitarian law applies, but to what extent do human rights apply? Of course, we have the basic rule coming from the International Court of Justice that both apply, but that's very difficult to work with and it generates uncertainty. And it's through uh, cases that, in fact, Sir Christopher has been involved in um, many years ago, in a sense, but following Francisco's identification of this issue of uncertainty, cases like Al Skeni, Al Jeddah, and more recently Hassan that you've seen uh, the European Court of Human Rights very gradually working out some way that you can see human rights obligations being applied alongside the lex specialis of international humanitarian law. Interestingly, although uns in an unspoken way, uh, with a form of priority being given to the lex specialis of international, human, uh, uh, international humanitarian law. Um, so this uncertainty is absolutely one of the, the concerns that one sees uh, in Francisco's work here. And it leads to one of the key themes um, of the lectures the point that due to the challenges of globalization, the expansion that I've mentioned that he refers to in different sources of international law and the difficulties caused by fragmentation, there is a, a new priority, as Francisco puts it, 
to identify the basic principles of international law. And he sees this as all the more important in circumstances where you have a much greater public interest in the uh, identification and application of international law uh, within the domestic community, um, and also a much greater reference to public international law before the domestic courts. And remember, this is Francisco writing in 2001, and that is all the more so, greatly all the more so, uh, the case in the um, 15 and more uh, years that have elapsed since. So against this very apt uh, appreciation of the challenges posed by globalization, um, the lectures then developed three broad themes. Um, the first is the need to identify and establish basic constitutional rules for the governance of international society including, very interestingly, the feasibility of establishing some for sort of international constitutional court, or at least expanding the role of the International Court of Justice. The second theme is um, one of the themes I, th I see as close to Francisco's heart, that is the emergence of individuals as a subject and actor um, in international law, and particularly in international dispute settlement. And the third theme, an important but perhaps often neglected theme, is the theme of alternative dispute resolution. So if I can say a few more words on each of these themes. Um, uh, as to the first, the thesis is not that, oh yes, there's the UN Charter, um, and that has certain constitutional elements. And so what we need is a court to review um, the exercise of power by the Security Council. Of course, he's entirely aware of all those arguments and he discusses the arguments uh, for and against there being any such power uh, within the International Court of Justice. Uh, but his view as to the role of this constitutional court is much more in terms of the identification and consolidation, consolidation of a series of uh, basic principles. Uh, the way he puts it is to say uh, that some of the basic principles of international law are found today in the Charter of the United Nations and certain other major treaties. As interactions in the international society become more intense, there will be an increasing need to identify and implement the essential principles of international law that govern such relations. Um, I think we could all agree with that. To identify those principles and their application to changing circumstances is to a large extent a judicial function, one that involves not only the interpretation of treaties, but also a careful examination of customary law and the practice of states. And this exercise has a very specific constitutional dimension. Merrills has commented, since international law is more controversial than domestic law, the international judge is more like a US Supreme Court justice deciding a point of constitutional interpretation than a domestic judge with a routine case. Well, a very interesting thought, which one um, might or might not agree with, but when one can certainly sympathize uh, with the need for the establishment or the, uh, the easy, easy identification of basic principles to which all can adhere to. Um, the absence of a written constitution, of course, is something that he confronts uh, in his work, when he's, when he's uh, lectures, when he's looking at this theme. But actually, he points to the model of the United Kingdom as saying, well, you don't have to have a written constitution for there to be a court which fulfills uh, certain constitutional activities. And I think, um, 
that seems to be also marvelously apt in terms of what we've been seeing uh, in <coughs> recent days where the UK Supreme Court has, at least in my eyes, um, performed uh, an absolutely excellent function ensuring the upholding of the UK <coughs> unwritten constitution. Um, again, I think one of the themes that comes through this book uh, is one of recognizing certain areas where there is a need for development in international law. This is always backed up by a solid assessment of the reality of what can be achievable. Um, so of course Francisco is entirely aware of the huge difficulties there could ever be in constituting uh, a new international court. And where he's really coming down to is expressing the hope that the International Court of Justice is going to come to fulfill uh, this role uh, more and more through exercising its judicial function, uh, both in contentious cases and through its advisory jurisdiction. And interestingly, in light of what Sir Christopher was saying, here he has very much in mind not a court pronouncing ex cathedra um, on broad statements, trying to establish new principles, but very much the, the building up of a steady and reliable body of jurisprudence. Um, and he's referring to uh, various sources in that respect, with a particular focus, in fact, on, on Sir Robbie Jennings. Um, he also envisages a greater use of the court's advisory jurisdiction, um, hoping that requests would focus less on a given dispute, uh, but more on reflecting where there is a need for interpretation of given international law rules and principles. And again, one can very much see the force in this, and many have wondered uh, whether the court's advisory jurisdiction has been underused. If I can move on then <clears throat> to his second theme, the uh, individual in international law and the settlement of uh, the claims of individuals. Um, here, uh, Francisco is very focused on, on the expanding uh, access that the individual has uh, to international dispute settlement uh, and clearly uh, recognizes that as a, a very important development in international law. And what he is uh, arguing for uh, is development towards greater access. And here one of the uh, focuses is in the book is on the requirement of the various requirements of nationality uh, that come through either in diplomatic protection claims or as established in any given bilateral investment treaty. Uh, and he is keen to see some reduction where possible in rules, for example, the rule on continuous nationality, thinking, well, yes, of course, in many cases, it's correct to apply the, the basic rule in Mavramatis, that where you have a diplomatic protection case, the underlying right is the right of the state. But in certain instances, the right is directly conferred on the individual, not on the state. And in those circumstances, why would you need a rule of continuous nationality as long as the national uh, had the, the individual had the relevant nationality at the date of the breach? Now, obviously, that, and he's well aware in this uh, series of lectures, um, is looking to develop the law. Um, and it's not a development that uh, has been reflected, for example, in the 2006 uh, ILC draft articles or um, still less in cases which have proved very important in, in certain aspects of nationality, continuous nationality like the Lowen case. Um, but nonetheless, 
one can see his identification of an, an important gap um, in international law protection of individuals. And one can applaud his desire to see that gap filled where possible. Of course, when it comes to his role as arbitrator, there he uh, acts in an entirely different way. Here he is thinking and putting forward ideas as an academic informed by an immense practice. Um, where he is sitting as arbitrator in well-known cases on nationality like Syag and Vecchi and Egypt, there he is much stricter in terms of uh, the rules and nationality. And in fact, one sees that in his dissenting opinion in the Syag and Vecchi case, which perhaps people will uh, return to when they're focusing on this area of uh, Francisco's arbitral work <coughs> this afternoon. Turning, turning back to the lectures, the, uh, there are various other radical thoughts when he's looking at uh, increasing access for individuals, uh, including, interestingly, the possibility that an individual might be able to bring a claim before the International Court of Justice. Uh, and of course, he recognizes that would require a change in the statute, which would be very difficult to achieve. Uh, he also recognizes that there would be a need for various screening processes, including possibly screening in front of some special commission of jurists. But the basic underlying thesis, I think, is clear and uh, attractive in recognizing that there's a disconnect between the international law protections of individuals and the remedies that are available to them and he is thinking of what further changes there could be to address these. Uh, moving briefly on to the third theme in the lectures, um, alternative dispute resolution, Francisco portrays this um, as a slightly underexposed uh, and certainly very important, uh, I was playing a very important role um, in both the settlement but also the prevention of international law disputes. Um, he s wishes to see some sort of structure given to the multiple different forms of alternative dispute resolutions that are uh, established through um, however many different treaties. And here he's not thinking unrealistically about how could there be an overarching structure to bring together uh, thousands of different treaties, um, but rather more realistically <clears throat> in terms of having a means of bringing to the attention of parties the different means that there are available to resolve disputes so that there is a proper focus on negotiation proper focus on conciliation uh, before one goes on to uh, compulsory dispute settlement. And again, one sees the force of that um, today and particularly perhaps in the light of the success of the Timor-Leste and Australia uh, conciliation known well to certain of those in the room. A more radical proposal <clears throat> is that the ICJ might direct parties to undertake some form of alternative dispute resolution, either at the beginning of a case um, or once the case was underway. Um, I think a quick look at the court's current docket uh, would make that look impractical in many of the cases in front of the International Court of Justice. And of course, there are um, uh, questions um, as to whether the court's powers would permit this. Um, but the basic message, of course, is a very valuable one, that states should be thinking more about alternative dispute resolution before they go off straight to arbitration or to the International Court of Justice. Uh, so this is a, um, a set of lectures that I'm very sorry indeed 
uh, not to have attended back in 2001. Um, I'm very grateful indeed to have been asked to, to provide the comment today on the lectures. In fact, it's been a great privilege. Um, and I simply would like to recommend you to the book, which of course is available at all good bookstores, including no doubt the LSE bookstore around the corner. Thank you. Thank you so much, and now I'll ask Jean-Marc Touvenin, who is uh, the Secretary General of the Hague Academy of International Law, a job of enormous responsibility, as it not only puts on the traditional uh, summer courses, but now does winter courses, seminars, preparations for exams, um, interactions with a variety of uh, international war actors. If he'll say a few words to us, uh, it needn't be more, Jean-Marc, but a few words will be most appreciated. Thank you very much, Madame Chair. Uh, Excellencies, uh, uh, members of the family, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, it's an honor to say some words, indeed, uh, about um, the relations between the Hague Academy of International Law and uh, Francesco Orego Vicuña in the context of a panel on the development of international law. So some of you could, see, could say, well, perhaps you should have talked in panel three, because panel three is about teaching and a kind of pursuit of international law, but in fact, the Hague Academy of International Law says, at least, I think it's true, that it contributes to the development of international law uh, through clarification of what it is, through consolidation of the concepts, and this is due to the work of the professors working with the Academy. I personally, and I'm, I'm sorry for that, I, I didn't know uh, Francisco Rigo Vicuña, uh, but for sure, the souvenir he left at the Academy permits to uh, provide ample elements that demonstrate the close relationship between uh, Francesco and the Academy. I should perhaps try however, to say that when I look at the CV, I have found there are many CVs, in fact, on, on the web, uh, and in, also in the collective courses. I don't see that Francesco Orego Vicuña was an attendee of, has been an attendee, is an alumni of the Hague Academy. And so I assume he, he did not follow the courses when he was a, a, a young academic or a, a student. And perhaps the reason is that the summer courses are in summer in Europe, which is winter in Chile, uh, and it renders things more complicated. And this is why, indeed, we uh, launched the winter courses recently. And perhaps, if it had existed at the time, we could see in the CV of Francisco Orego Vicuña that he participated as an attendee to uh, the Academy. But uh, his first work with the Academy dates back to 1969, uh, when he participated to the external program uh, for Latin America in, in Bogota. So that was 50 years before, and it was the first year uh, the Academy held an external program, and this year we had two external programs, one in Marco and one in Bogota. So it was kind of inaugurating this long-standing uh, story. Then he was invited to contribute to a colloquium on legal aspects of economic integration held at The Hague in 1971. So, so the date is interesting because it means that the people at the academy at the time, they, saw, they met him in 1969 in Mexico, in, the, in Bogota, sorry, and they said, we should invite him in The Hague. And the first occasion was with this colloquium on legal aspects of economic integration. Then, of course, he published this uh, uh, special course given at the academy in the collected courses dated 1986, and the topic was, and I'm sorry I tell it in French because it taught in French at the Academy, la zone économique exclusive, régime et nature juridique dans le droit international. I'm quite proud that he wrote that in French uh, because people think I'm from Norway, but I'm, I'm from Paris. Uh, 
Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, he also participated and probably organized two external programs in Santiago in 1991 and 2011. Also, he participated in an ex external program in Mexico in 2002 and also to a colloquium on the United Nations Security Council in 1992. Unfortunately, besides the collected courses, the Academy does not publish the other works and I have no trace of what he said at the time. But I'm sure that some of these thoughts are now uh, reflected in the uh, Herr Lotherbach lectures. So for sure, the Academy is proud and, and grateful to count in its Hall of Fame uh, count on uh, Francesco Orego Vicuña, the writing of whom have their good place in the collected courses of the Hague Academy of International Law. Thank you very much. Yeah. Colleagues, I think we have time for a couple of questions or observations before we move on to the next panel. If anyone wishes to ask a question or make uh, a comment, please will you identify yourselves. Everyone is satisfied with the general introductory remarks they've heard from this panel. Well then, I think the thing is to thank you all very much for your attention, to uh, thank on your behalf our speakers, and I will uh, now hand over uh, the chair to Dr. Manush Arsanjani, who is taking care of the next panel. Thank you very much.
going to yes, be Yes, you take your time. Yes, 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 yes. I think we have plenty of time. I think we have plenty of time, yes. Are you interested in how you want to sit on the other side? Do you prefer this here for three or four? How were you like? It's the same for me. Remember that we are... Where are you going to sit? I'm going to sit here. Okay. I'll sit here. to start? It's an honor and a privilege to be invited to speak about uh, Professor Urigo Vicuña's contribution to international organizations. This morning, we heard about his contribution to the development of international law, and clearly he had had a very um, broad approach to international law, and it, as the um, other panels go on, you would realize that he had a um, much significant interest in every branch of, uh, of international law. International organizations are a permanent and one of the essential features in international relations and of international law. Whether they are universal, such as the United Nations and those organizations within the UN system, or whether they are outside the UN system but are open for universal membership, such as the WTO or Law of the Sea Institutions, or they are regional and sub-regional organizations, of which there are many, they all are significant actors in the making and the application of international law. Professor Orego uh, Vicuña understood that international organizations were too big and too important to be ignored in any serious scholarly work on international law. He published a number of searching articles dealing with international organizations and made many recommendations for improving their functions. This panel explores Francisco's scholarship and on contribution to international organizations. It is important to remember that the foundational universal organization, the United Nations, was created following the death and destruction of World War II. 
By some estimates, 3% of the world population in 1940 perished. That is an estimated total death of between 70 million to 85 million people. From the depths of such enormous destruction, there was a surge of idealism about the potential of the New World Organization to identify and protect the common interests of the world community. In 1945, the 51 original member states of the UN were optimistic that a limited membership organ, the Security Council, with the major powers as the uh, guardians of peace and security, will be able to maintain the international peace and security. But that optimism, and with it much of the idealism which supported it, soon evaporated. With the onset of the Cold War and the rise of membership of the organization, the sense that there was a common interest for the organization to protect became increasingly tenuous. This concern about whether and how the institutional framework of the UN could be modified so that it could be more effective in identifying and taking steps to protect the common interest animated much of Francisco's scholarly work with respect to international organizations. Francisco's proposals were based on the realization that the true crisis of the United Nations was that it had been designed to work in a reality that no longer existed. Yet Francisco did not shrink from the reality. His writings showed that he was acutely aware of the role of power in international system. And he did not believe that legal arrangements such as the UN Charter by itself could curb unilateral influence. For him, states remain the center of international law. Francisco saw the function of international organizations as institutionalizing international cooperation with only exceptional autonomous decision making. He accepted that the greater the power of states, the greater their influence in international organizations. For him, the League of Nations was not structured on two different realities. That is, there were very little changes in the power structure of world politics since 1920s. As a scholar whose jurisprudential approach emphasized state consent, Francisco had a preference for the ICJ and in general for judicial decisions, as we understood this morning as well. This was probably because in his view, common interests had already been identified in international law by states, which the United Nations and other international organizations are then to protect. Hence, institutions that are authorized to interpret and apply international law should enjoy a more prominent role. For Francisco, the most competent of these institutions are judicial bodies. His proposed institutional reforms of the United Nations, uh, which I comment on only a few of them, sought to make international law a centerpiece to modulate international political rivalries. The rivalry was not just among the states. He also saw them infecting the principal organs of the UN. He believed that the drafters of the charter did not establish the principal organs of the UN, that is the Secretary General, General Assembly, Security Council, and the court as isolated entities, but as institutions whose cooperation and collaboration were essential for the success of the UN. Having identified the location of common interests in international law, Francisco's most fervent hope focus on judicial settlement and on improving amicable dispute resolution, either by conciliation or compulsory jurisdiction. He saw a more effective system within the UN Charter to be the one that links chapter six of the Charter, that is specific settlement of disputes, with chapter seven on enforcement actions by the Security Council, so that the failures to ensure settlement of disputes by peaceful means would automatically mean taking actions under Chapter 7. 
Conscious of the reluctance of the disputant parties to submit to the court <coughs> with binding decisions, Francisco proposed considerations be given to the establishment of a permanent conciliation committee as a subsidiary organ of the General Assembly. With regard to the ICJ, Francisco envisaged a much larger role. He felt that the ICJ is no longer an exclusively a UN organ, but makes services to international community as a whole, particularly in terms of the constitutional function. Therefore, in his view, there was no reason to limit the election of judges to the Security Council and the General Assembly. He thought that the traditional election process had become heavily politicized, lending a political character to the appointment of judges and to some extent to the court itself, thus reinforcing the reluctance of states to submit a number of disputes to the court. Because of the expanded role of the court, Francisco proposed the possibility of creating one or more posts of advocate general, an institution that has done much for the development of the law in several domestic jurisdictions and of European law. He saw as the most difficult relationship among the principal organs to be between the Security Council and the court in balancing concurrent jurisdictions. He seemed to support the court's rejection in the Nicaragua case that it was only for the Security Council to deal in cases involving the international use of force, hence reaffirming the court's role in conflict resolution from the perspective of enforcing international law. But he was also critical of the court's incorrect fact-finding in respect of Nicaragua's activities. In his view, just as accurate fact-finding and information gathering is essential for the adequate discharge of the Security Council functions, so is it also for the International Court of Justice in adjudicating in cases involving international conflict. In his view, the same machinery that might be set up for the Security Council and the Secretary General, including the function of intelligence gathering, should be made available to the International Court. He saw this intelligence function as essential in reassuring the role of the court in matters involving concurrent jurisdiction with the Security Council. Francisco was not in favor of instant internationalizing any regional conflict. He felt that when states have entered into regional arrangements or have established regional agencies, they should be required to make every effort as required by Article 52, Paragraph 2 of the Charter, to have the local disputes settled through such regional arrangements. In discussions of international organizations, uh, Francisco was a scholar whose voice was always moderate, as we also heard this morning, and his commitment to common interests of the world community was unyielding. He was so soft-spoken, generous, and his compelling view, voice will be missed. It is now my pleasure to introduce two other speakers who will be speaking about Francisco's scholarship and contribution to international organization. First is Ambassador uh, Alberto Van Cleveren. He's a, a former vice president of the uh, Chilean uh, foreign ministry. He has an extensive diplomatic experience representing Chile abroad, including before the European Union and the ICJ. Ambassador Van Cleveren is a professor of law and of international relations at the Institute of International Studies of Chile. He will then be followed by Professor Andrea Lucas Guerin, who is currently the academic coordinator for the master's program at Heidelberg Center for Latin America. Uh, Professor Lucas Guerin has extensive publications on human rights, environmental law, energy law, and teaches both in Chile and Argentina. I would now ask Professor, uh, Ambassador Van Cleveren. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Asayani. Excellencies, uh, members of the Orrego family, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. 
It's an honor to participate in this seminar in such a distinguished company and audience. Everything which could have been said about Francisco Orrego Vicuña has already been said. However, I must express our gratitude for the role that Francisco played as director of the Institute of International Studies of the University of Chile. At a very difficult time, he was able to reconstruct and consolidate our institute. He defended the pluralism against many odds and promoted an environment which allowed all of us to work uh, freely and to contribute to academic work. For that, uh, we owe Francisco special gratitude. Professor Orrego, in his prolific writings, touched upon very different areas of international law and international relations. He was an expert in subst uh, substantive black letter law in many subjects, but he had also structural concerns about the nature and future of international law. He offered explorations into the notion of lawmaking, whether in the global or regional domain, and into the limits and possibilities of competing normative orders. He was keen to probe into the question of what qualifies as international law and how to distinguish it from non-law, while at the same time he was concerned with the identification of particular sources of international law and their interrelationship about the role of specific actors such as states, international organizations, and non-state actors. I will attempt to deal with some of these issues. Politics and law have long been seen as separate domains of international relations, as realms of action with their own rationalities and consequences. It was not always so. Before the Second World War, many professors of international law lectured also in international relations. Although there were many reasons to separate teaching and research in both fields, the dialogue between them has been affected. International law has been presented as a regulatory regime external to international politics, a framework of rules and institutional practices, an impartial system of rules with, their, with the tacit assumption that the law will be enforced. By contrast, international relations have been seen, at least in the more traditional approaches, as the interplay of power politics in a context of virtual anarchy, where international law is perceived as a mere component in the struggle of states for power or security, as a set of propositions devoid of non-instrumental significance or prescriptive worth. From both sides of the divide, international politics and law have been treated as categorically distinct. This neat separation of politics and law seems unrealistic. The complex entanglement of politics and law has been evident in the elaboration of international regimes in which Francisco Orrego participated throughout his brilliant career. Whether we refer to the Antarctic regime, to human rights, to the law of the sea, world trade rules, investment law, fisheries law, or deep seabed mining regulation, politics and specific political, strategic, and economic interests have always been present. On the other hand, the discourse of international politics is usually replete with the language of law and legitimacy. All countries proclaim their strict adherence to international law, and even the worst international offenders justify their actions under the authority or so of solemn international principles. 
Politics and international law are not only interconnected. There is also feedback between them. Politics has constituted the international legal system, but international politics is in turn transformed by the legal order. Although the international system is decentralized, states accept international regimes, that is, delineated areas of rule-governed activities. The international regimes approach can be seen as an attempt to bridge the gulf between international politics and former organizational arrangements. The regime's movement represented an effort to theorize about international governance more broadly. Regimes were identified for specific issue areas. Principles and norms provide the normative framework for regimes, while rules and decision-making procedures provide more specific injunctions for appropriate behavior. The concept of regime was not alien to the work of Francisco Rego, as attested by his book on the exclusive economic zone or his analysis of mineral Antarctic resources or deep seabed resources. The effectiveness of a regime rests on the operation of institutions, organizations, <coughs> governments, and international bodies that share a set of principles, rules, and norms in a particular area of international action. Although regimes include formal treaties and national law, they also rely on informal norms and networks to develop and enforce standard behavior in an area of global policy. Successful international regimes tend to evolve through three main stages. Initially, there is an agenda-setting phase where common problems are identified and reasons for international actions are developed. In the second phase, states and other actors meet to agree the principles, norms, rules, and decision-making procedures for a treaty or framework convention. Third, states move into a phase of regime strengthening, whereby negotiations work towards supplementing the framework convention incrementally through further agreements. The history of climate diplomacy seems to fit the first two stages of this model, and perhaps we are starting to witness the third phase through the COP meetings within the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. International regime analysis is helpful to understand the evolutionary nature of international law a subject to which Francisco Rego paid special attention. International regimes have evolved in very different and even contrasting ways. In some cases, regimes have given way to branches of international law, human rights, law of the sea, environmental law, trade law, Antarctic law, outer space law. In others, they contain more specific areas of regulation, deep seabed mining, bilateral or regional disarmament regimes, fisheries in particular areas, financial regulations, and many others. Some regimes have been relatively successful. Others are still under construction, and still others have failed. Up to now, there's no clear, clear global regime for the fostering of democratic governance. The existence of a right to democracy in any country of the world is still a highly debatable issue. The situation changes when we speak of regions like Europe and the Americas, where the right to democracy has been embodied in different legal instruments. But even there, not all states accept its, its existence. The degree of legalization of international regimes tend to vary considerably. It can be measured in several dimensions. Obligation which means that states and other actors are bound by a set of rules or commitments. Precision, which means that the rules unambiguously define the conduct they require, authorize, or proscribe. Delegation, which means that third parties have been granted authority to implement, interpret, settle disputes, and possibly make rules. And finally, state acceptance or consent, 
a subject which was of special concern of Francisco and to which I will return. For Professor Orrego, the nation state had to be regarded as the principal reference point for lawmaking. And a crucial distinction had to be made between domestic law on one hand and international law on the other. He was not convinced by the argument of the erosion of the distinction between international law and non-international law, or the globalization or the denationalization of lawmaking. He recommended caution and prudence regarding the flood of international norm making from international organizations. In his words, quote, the functions and powers of international organizations are derived from the state, and it is the state that directly or indirectly sets the limit within which such organizations operate, end of quote. He was reluctant to accept increasing soft law flowing out from different international bodies, probably because their very softness gave such lawmaking an air of voluntariness and created the impression that states could choose whether and how to domestically implement the internationally produced soft law. <coughs> He was aware that non-binding international law does not have to be ratified by domestic legislative processes, making it easier to implement, especially through local courts, than binding law such as treaties. He recognized the growing pluralism of international lawmaking with the participation of states, international organizations, supranational entities, private actors, and individuals but he upheld the primacy of the state in the process. He stressed that international law is still an interstate system of law, which has peace, the settlement of disputes, and the well-being of the individual as its focal objectives. This has always been of the essence of international law, and it must be preserved. Both through his participation in international lawmaking and as a judge and arbitrator, Professor Orrego had to deal with the problem of the fragmentation of international law. The existence of a fragmented landscape of competing legal regimes was familiar to him, and it was also a source of concern to him. The case of international adjudication, which Orrego knew well, reflects as well the fragmentation. For most of the 20th century, international courts were almost in existence. Aside from the venerable International Court of Justice and those dispute settlement procedures that did exist, such as the GATT panels, which did not function as judicial bodies, there was very little more. Professor Fitzmaurice could write in 1986 correctly that, quote, it's a rarity of the international, in the international field for there to be any possibility of more than one forum, end of quote, for a given dispute. Several changes altered this picture. The consolidation of human rights courts in Europe and the Americas led to an increasing number of cases. On the other hand, the rise of international criminal law, an entirely new legal regime, generated several new tribunals and an array of complex doctrinal opinions and judgments. The GATT system was converted into the WTO, which created an appellate body, which increasingly took the trade order away from the diplomatic consultative approach to a world of legal cases and rulings in a process that has been resisted by major powers. Other courts were also set up, such as the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. And regional integration, another topic which Professor Orrego analyzed, led to the formation or revival of several tribunals. Orre Orrego's trajectory illustrates this trend. Ad hoc judge at the ICJ, at ITLOS, and a Chilean appellate court, 
judge of administrative tribunals of the IMF and the World Bank, member and many times chair of numerous World Trade Organization dispute settlement panels, member of the Commission for the Settlement of Disputes between Chile and the United States, as has already been explained, an arbitrator in numerous cases under ANCITRAL and ICSID frameworks. Performing his multiple functions, he had to cope with legal regimes that recognized different and not always compatible objectives. A well-known report of the ILC issued in 2006 analyzed the emergence of new and special types of law, self-contained regimes, and geographically and functionally limited treaty systems. Each rule complex or regime come, comes with its own principles, its own forms of expertise, and its own ethos, not necessarily identical to the ethos of neighboring specialization. Fragmentation is not a destructive phenomenon per se. It can also be a sign of maturity reflecting the pluralism of international law. It is also a consequence of the absence of a single global legislature or mandatory world court with general jurisdiction to mold a unified body of international law. Regimes such as trade, human rights, investments, and environmental protection may in certain cases be in harmony, but, many, but may also be in conflict with each other in many others. Different mandates, principles, structures, and non-identical state membership of regimes may lead to lack of coordination. International courts may, whether or not at the request of the parties in their decisions, approach overlapping regimes that are relevant for the dispute at hand. Let me now turn to another subject which was cause of serious concern for Francisco, consent. For him, consent is constitutive of the international legal order. States must consent to any rules before they may be considered binding upon them. Treaties and even customary international law are based on norms of state consent, whether explicit or tacit. Although some legal obligations do not rest on specific state consent, in a broad sense, states accept or consent to them through their adherence to the great system of international law. What is important is that there is a clear and unequivocal manifestation of the will of the state. By requiring the explicit or implicit consent of nations before a particular inter international standard binds them, it gains the legitimacy that democratic legal traditions and processes provide. Francisco would agree with his good friend Prosper Weil, quote, absent voluntarism, international law would no longer perform its function, end of quote. In this symposium, we are dealing with the impressive contribution that Professor Orrego has made to the international legal order, which has been developed after the Second World War. This international legal order has represented, to a certain extent, the skeleton of the international liberal order. When we speak of a rule-based order, we are speaking of modern international law. To what extent will this rule-based order survive? How resilient will the modern international regimes prove? What is going to happen to the WTO trade regime without a functioning appellate body and a growing trade war between its major players. What is going to happen to human rights regimes, which are being questioned by several states? What is going to happen with international criminal law, and especially the ICC, when major players have not only resisted its consolidation, but are also trying to limit its work? How many of the institutions of the rule-based order will remain immune to populist reactions, growing nationalism, 
and a profound mistrust of the international order. Is the jungle of anarchy and crude power relations growing back? We do not have the answers. What we can reason reasonably assume is that the order will inevitably look different as this century progresses, and that some of the institutions and roles which have been established by internationalists, such as Professor Orrego, will be modified or even replaced. But we can also expect that basic principles of international law that he always defended will continue to prevail, such as the sanctity of treaties, the protection of the individual, the peaceful settlement of disputes, and or the prohibition of the use of force. After all, many members of the international community seek to the preservation and development of a world order of dignity under the rule of law, not a brutal system of unfettered nationalism, unilateralism, and power politics. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, firstly, thanks uh, to the organizing institution for this invitation to participate in the symposium to celebrate Professor Orrego Vicuña. I can only say that for me, he was a very special person in Chile, very motivating and with a deep and committed vision of international law. He had in his great humanity the engine of his performances. I was first his student, and then I worked for 14 years with him in the Master in International Law with the Heidelberg University and the Chile University, and this program was taken care of by Don Francisco personally in every detail, and I learned it a lot uh, by his side, but moreover, I learned it uh, with always think uh, in the student in a manner that through this LLM, they can give the best. I'm pleased to see here the authority of the Heidelberg Center of the, the Chile University and professors and graduates of the LLM, and of course, Professor Orrego family. And we have to thank your, your generosity uh, for, to share him for many decades with us. In this brief presentation, I would like to comment first uh, the process to, that let me uh, address the sources. Second, the main list lessons that we can der derive from the ideas of Professor Orrego about his own vision of international organization. And third, the lesson that what I learned in the preparation of this pre presentation. And finally, a recommendation. I'm very sorry for my English. Searching in the production of Professor Orrego Vicuña, we can see in his extensive biography in three languages, in Spanish, English, and French, that he has dealt uh, with an impressive variety of topics, and many of them have focused in recent years on dispute resolution and arbitration. In the search of sources uh, related to his vision of international organization, I had the uh, invaluable help of Professor Eslata Drande Clement of the National Universidad Nacional de Córdoba, uh, who sent me articles and chapter written by Professor Orrego uh, that are not, not, not are in the curriculum. Um, also, uh, I have to thank the library of the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg. In my investigation, I found that an interesting part of his ideas on international organization were produced in the 70s and 80s, and this idea continued to deepen the study of international law and the changes in the new 21th century that he wrote then. Uh, at that time, he argued about the actor of international law. He affirmed that the state has not anymore a an unique and exclusive role because it shares functions with international organization and other entities, although it still re retains a predominant position. And this really reality has always been present because although the very origin of the state has an intellectual conception destined for be a defender of individuals from the abuses of, of political power, at some point the state forgot the exist conception and acquired a supremacy abusing the community that swore to defense. Uh, therefore, the international community built international cooperation organization system since this moment it highlights the own role of the, that individual was assuming as an actor of international law. In like manner, Professor was a critical of the system of international organization and said that what is affecting international organization is that they have sought to attend their own in interests instead of the interests interest of the supposed recipients in, of their mission. We take it 
as indicative that the international community seek other forms of understanding and regulation. With this idea of seeking ways of understanding and, and regulation, he proposed greater transparency and professionalism in performance of international organizations. In his analysis of international organizations, he emphasized that they continue to depend on the consensus of member states and other factors that are present in international law from their origin, although expressed informally and differently. He said that international organizations are agents through which state channel their cooperation. For that reason, a state continues to safeguard their autonomy, especially in sensitive areas. Likewise, his vote includes the leadership of selected powers within the international organizations and its importance in the creation of international law and how that was repeated in different historical periods. We does not mean that there was no criticism. He also recognizes the role for non-governmental organizations as an individuals and in the creation of international law, but it was not generalized for Professor Orrego and as example of area where there was greater influence, he mentioned human rights, investment protection, and trade conflicts. He also found the idea about the advances of regionalism as a reality that should not go unnoticed. For Professor Orrego, uh, these regionalists were presented in a very structured and institutionalized manner or an informal and decentralized manner. The nature of international society, society is an universal one, but it's supported to a large extent by regional structures. In this way, he affirmed that centralized international action that can be associated with the nature of global society will only be possibly a reality if it relies on effective regional cooperation. In his idea about regionalism are interesting because he recognized a role in the process of codification of international law. I even recognized that in the case of the European community, the codification process has been stronger and several issues than the process of universal elaboration itself. In this point, he studied the European economic community and the process of delegation of certain competencies and Professor Orrego warned of a policy of restriction from the member state. Regarding regionalism, he wrote specifically on supranationality, where he discussed the concept and scope of intergovernmental organization. This article, the article that I, I, I read was published in 1965 for the uh, uh, Revista de Estudios Internacionales de la Universidad de Chile with the great quality and scientific value. In this publication, he argued about the magnific magnificent com combination of elements has been a progress and a dynamic that had never been thought of an overcoming of problems that afflicted the whole continent and a new thinking of change and union to achieve the integration of Europe worthy and admiration and imitation. I wanted to rescue that thought of Professor Orrego, especially in this occasion. A very significant article about Latin American region was published for Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo in, in 1977. And he highlighted there two decades of myths about integration in Latin America allows to learn from the failures to build stable and lasting processes, which are centrally the attitude and criteria of government are those that fail not the political or technical formulas. And it addresses the myth of integration in our region. His studies were also focused in the Pacific region, so trending now, but Professor Orrego wrote about the 70s and the 80s about that. Regarding the codification process of international law, is a topic he wrote in several articles and in free languages. For, for international organizations, he recognized that they share functions with the state as a complementary role. He also recognized that they have facilitated the conduct of negotiation and the grouping of state with the highest affinity, making essential cooperation between states a reality. Something interesting that he pointed out is how before these diplomatic ne negotiation processes were confidential or secret, and with the intervention of international organizations, they become more transparent, which also facilitate future parliamentary participation in national legal system, an important finding that collaborate with national democracies. He highlighted another idea about international organization with example uh, about World Bank, uh, international labor organization and agencies from environmental protection, that they privileged the negotiation and compliance assistance that they forced a compliance. This lesson of the, for the, of the 20th century were concrete contribution of the international organization for the solution of controversies. His study were also focused in, in various individual international organization uh, thus highlighting the article on the institution created by the Bretton Woods 
agreement, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, published in 1975, and the Organization of American States of the 1985. In the first, he aborted the international economy system, confirming that this only included the multilateral technique in the institution, but not changes in the essential principles of the system that had been operating since the 19th century, all to ensure international peace and security. With which he criticized the system in his legal principles and institutions, saying that they have lost the reason for being and their operativity, if not their legitimacy, in an international society radically different from the one that they conceived them, especially because they don't consider the presence of developing countries, which have precisely have been the fundamental factor of change of international society. I think that this, 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 this words are still valid. About the organization of American state and the protocol of reforms of the charter in the 1985, he said that the new definition sought to revalue the traditional role of the regional organization in the political and legal field without prejudice to its continued activity in economic, social, cooperation, and cultural, but without creating an imbalance in detriment of the traditional role as to some moment had been happening. He especially analyzed the dispute resolution procedures, the role of the uh, EOAS Secretary General, the new criteria for incorporating members, the Calvo Clause, and the regional condition, among others. It should be noted that the significant number of his work were published in the Revista de Estudios Internacionales, de la, del Instituto de Estudios Internacionales de la Universidad de Chile, under the protection of the editor, Rose Cave, that is here, and I want to highlight uh, her excellent work. I will not refer uh, to the idea of the United Nations that was part of my, my colleague here, uh, but I would like to make a separate comment about the article Trade and Environment that was uh, from 1998, uh, published in the Libera Micorum to Gunther Zenick, edited by Professor Wolfram, include, that it includes a compilation of his harmonized ideas of the two areas of international law to regime that I had not uh, had the opportunity to read before. Uh, I think that it's a treasure that will help me for future development of my work. This work deals with the World Trade Organization <coughs> as an international organization in charge of the free trade that we are not, um, it, it highlights the understanding of these two topics in an orderly, serious, profound way of the discipline, institution, and jurisprudence of the WTO, solid and inclusive. Uh, this brief journey uh, of, on some thoughts that I found from the international organization allows me to confirm this full conviction that Professor Orrego Vicuña has about international law, held from his humanist uh, vision that the, where the individual is uh, the key, and the structure of understanding and regulation that are developed in international law are at his service. Uh, not to put obstacles in their protection, but to realistically ensure protection. Professor Orrego enjoyed full knowledge of international relations that I think, like, like Alberto told before, uh, I think that uh, this full knowledge um, allowed him uh, uh, with the realistic analysis with constructive, comprehensive, and long-term ideas of international law. And allow, in, allowed him uh, to maintain that there was in the international law a process of limitation of a state sovereignty within the framework of international organization, but it was a process controlled by the state themselves and limited to very specific matters. This realism was very present in his, in his analysis that was I'm convinced that his ideas will last. What did I learn by writing this presentation? Four things. Firstly, uh, his vision was always legal. His was a, a legal approach of the, of the topics without, uh, even though the, the international relations knows that he has about the topics. Uh, always was a vision with, uh, with very innovative and uh, well in advance. Second, about, if, uh, about the fact that Professor Rego used to put his ideas into practice uh, with high scientific quality, which has been bind of practice of international law, allowing him to specify and influence regional and universal thinking with the ideas on which he had written decades before. That's something that we can see in the arbitration of where he wrote. And third, um, teaching, as a third te teaching, I think that um, he, this has to do with continuity and fidelity with colleagues that resulted in an extended collaborative cooperation over many decades of Professor Rego's work. Uh, this could be observed in the publication that he had, in, uh, he participated abroad with colleagues in with many, many countries, but with the continuity and fidelity relationship. 
Uh, fourth, uh, that they're learning is that for the, my next uh, article that I, I want to see what Professor Rego wrote before, <laughs> because I think that it's going to give me uh, uh, the pillars of international law that's very important to write something. And for that reason, I would like to make a suggestion uh, to create an open use website, uh, op a website to open, to have the, the Oregos work join it. I think it could be good for the, for the next generation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. I think one thing that uh, it seems to stand out uh, from this panel and part of morning panel is that um, uh, Francisco had a special emphasis on the state consent and uh, lawmaking by consent of the state, that the state is not bound by um, unless there is, there is a consent. Uh, he, he recognized that the others are participating. He reluctantly recognized that, that others are participating in lawmaking. For example, in, in 2005, he acknowledged in, in an article that there are now uh, civil societies, non-governmental organizations, and uh, international organizations that they participate in lawmaking. But he was uh, very much concerned that the, the, those they participate in lawmaking, they have to have very clear identity. It was very critical, for example, of the Rome Conference on the International Criminal Court, where he said that some members of the civil society became integrated into the delegations of states and it spoke the, the views of civil society as the views of states. So he was, he was very concerned this is mixing up the roles of those who participate uh, in lawmaking. So he was very, um, very critical of it and even though he, he realized that there are others that they participate in that, he thought that their identity has to be clear to everyone. You are speaking for international organizations or you're speaking as a civil society or you're speaking as a state because for him, uh, eventually the state consent in uh, really making a binding decision was an essential, uh, essential feature of international law. Um, I think we, are, we have a couple of minutes if there are any comments or uh, questions from the, from the audience. Yes. yes. Uh, this is a question for Alberto. Alberto, you knew him for so long. Uh, and I think uh, maybe you had the opportunity, I didn't certainly didn't have the opportunity to ask him about the relation between international relations and international law. Um, and certainly I think he had a vision when the institute was founded of how the disciplines should work together and learn from each other. So if you could tell us a little bit about that moment when the institute was created, what was his vision? I know the inspiration for that was the Royal Institute of International Affairs. Um, and you could draw a little bit on that historic uh, moment. And what was Francisco's vision at the time? Because maybe today, remembering that would be really helpful since, uh, but we know that uh, there are people who don't value diplomacy as much, don't value international law. I think it's very good that we recall what was Francisco's vision at the beginning. Well, thank you very much for, for the question. Yes, it's absolutely true that uh, Francisco always uh, promoted uh, 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 an integrated analysis between international law and international relations. Although, as it was said before, he always said, well, I'm speaking of international law, and uh, when I speak of international law, I remain within international law, you know, and I don't uh, mix it with international relations. But in the end, uh, he favored at the Institute always uh, an interdisciplinary approach the Institute uh, was established, as uh, Paz uh, said, uh, on, on the image of Chatham House, and it was established in 1966. Uh, it, uh, well, it, its first years were very positive years, but later on it got caught by political conflict in Chile, 
and uh, also uh, during the military regime, during the first years, it, it had a very difficult time. Uh, we were very fortunate uh, to, to have uh, Francisco as uh, director. He restored normality within the institute and uh, he favored a very pluralistic uh, approach, uh, both in terms of the disciplines uh, which were present at the institute and also uh, with respect to the orientations of many of the academics. Uh, it was uh, really an exception within a public university at that time in Chile. Uh, it was a sort of refuge for many people, for many well-known academics and later on also some politicians uh, uh, like uh, uh, former foreign minister Heraldo Muñoz who was for many years member of the institute and many others, you know. And uh, in, in, in disciplinary terms, uh, Francisco promoted many seminars, uh, especially he had a special interest, as was said, in the Pacific Basin. Uh, the Institute uh, was, I think, a pioneer in Chile in approaching Chile to the Pacific Basin institutions. Uh, uh, Francisco was very actively involved in in PEC, which was a sort of, uh, 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 well, it was, uh, yes, a Pacific Economic Cooperation Council, which integrated uh, states, academics, uh, and to a certain extent also civil society. And later on, it was very instrumental participating in, in PEC in order to join APEC, you know, uh, which is going to have its uh, next uh, summit uh, precisely in Chile uh, at the end of this year. And uh, uh, also Francisco was very interested in regional integration. Although it was a difficult subject, it's still a very difficult subject. It's a subject of many frustrations in, in, in Latin America. Uh, integration uh, in Latin America tried to follow the European model but the result uh, was very different, I think. And uh, up to now, we are still struggling and looking for new regional institutions. And uh, Francisco approached the integration also from an interdisciplinary approach. And he was not only interested in the politics of integration, but also in the law of integration. And actually he had some works on, uh, on the, I, I remember on the tribunal, for instance, on the Andean court. He, he published an article on the Andean court, uh, which didn't live up to its expectations. It was modeled, uh, you know, according to, to the European model, but up to now it's uh, really a, a very different story. So, uh, yes, I, I think uh, uh, Francisco was uh, uh, a, a very clear advocate of an interdisciplinary approach to international relations, including politics, uh, uh, legal uh, approaches, and also economics. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'm going to hand in the chair to um, Professor Tanzi, who will be following the next panel. There is a coffee break. But there is a coffee break. <laughs> Very good. Please join me and thank our Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sí, claro, claro.
character. You are I'm always you are always very clear. I'm not going to be original. I'm going to be from my heart. Not only from my heart, but mostly. I think I deserve some freedom now. Well, good, good morning, um, and thank you for, for coming back from, uh, from the coffee break, which I'm very pleased not to have uh, derogated from uh, going through without an untracked, as at some point seemed to, to be the case to the horror of many and most. So, Excellencies, uh, colleagues, friends, and members of uh, Orego Vicuña's family, uh, it is a great honor and, and, and a pleasure to be within the Chilean international legal community, friendly, very friendly to me, and, 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 and even now for, for this great opportunity. Uh, the topic of this third panel um, doesn't seem to be that new. It's teaching and the academic pursuit in Francisco Rego Vicuña's career. And obviously, we already heard quite a lot. Dame Higgins, in her general overview, has captured the main strands very clearly. And uh, the point has been taken up again in the last panel by Professor uh, Andrea Lucas, who was one of Orego Vicuña's pupils. Um, Sam Wordsworth and uh, Jean-Marc Touvenen, who we understand for the first time that he's from Paris rather than Oslo, um, respectively touched upon specific aspects of the teaching, uh, to some extent also research, to the extent that we got a publication um, at uh, Lauterpacht's lectures on uh, dispute settlement in an evolving world, and we also heard about the very committed endeavors by the maestro as far as teaching international law was concerned with the external programs of the academy, but also we heard about the very scholarly course he gave on the zone economique at the time when the zone economique was not to be taken for granted. That is something that we want to take into account. Now, from the debate so far, it has emerged quite clearly what were the cups of teas of the maestro. Regional integration, institutional international law, Antarctica, great passion, the law of the sea, for what it is not comprising Antarctica, and then uh, international dispute settlement, and international arbitration in investment law, which was also merging with with its practice. And there we heard that out of his great expertise, he became a very successful adjudicator and arbitrator. If we asked a young attorney or a young international law scholar nowadays, they would immediately remember Rego Vicuña for being a formidable arbitrator. But his success relies on the fact that he met a magic formula, one which in the old good days, or good old days, many could learn. And now it is a very rare formula to be found. He was a solid generalist. 
versed in many specialized areas, as it should be. And so we heard about his very many specialized areas. Um, but there are other areas that have not been singled out which deserve a bit of attention. I mean, his work on diplomatic and consular immunities that he published on the International Comparative Law Quarterly in 1991. I think we should render justice also to his studies on jurisdictional immunities, uh, not just sovereign immunities. And the status of, and the rights of refugees in the Inter-American Law Review of 1994 also deserves attention. But within the domain, let's say, the, the natural reserve of a proper generalist of international law, the law of secondary rules, treaty law, state responsibility, the way international rules interact with each other, why not mentioning the seminal piece he wrote on time in international law and arbitration in the Liber Amicorum for Charles Brower, um, 2015, a topic which is very dear to Dame Higgins, I suppose. And the other uh, scholarly endeavor was his reflections on softening necessity in the Liber Amicorum for Michael Riesman. And uh, there is a very, very sensitive spot and the very many investment arbitrations involving Argentina in which he himself was involved, Enron, GMS, SEMPRA, there the issue of state of necessity was to no avail to the respondent state. Because of Gachikov and Najimaros, why is that? The International Court of Justice took responsibility for a very rigid interpretation of the secondary rule of a circumstance precluding re circumstances. The ILC, I understand, was minded to loosen the rule. But the Gabchikovo Najimaros came out saying that the ILC codification, which was in the first reading, was customary law. And how could the ILC say, no, 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 you got it wrong? And it was very interesting to see how the maestro spotted the problem right from the core of it. Um, since so much has been said about the title of this panel, uh, the added value will be from the perspective. The first speaker, um, Dr. Walter Ekel, who reflects the cultured side of uh, the maestro, who is not so much of a lawyer as much as a man of culture, a former professor of um, English and German law and literature and culture, currently the uh, director of the center, Heidelberg Center um, for Latin America, based in Santiago, where uh, the maestro has worked extensively. And he will speak about the man behind the lawyer. Without further ado, Walter, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, dear Orego family, dear Ambassador David Gallagher, dear speakers, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for not being a jurist. <laughs> instead, instead of a learned, learned discussion of legal issues raised by Professor Orego, I shall talk about my personal recollections of a great scholar and a faithful and loyal friend. Um, Francisco Rego Viconia, the man behind the scholar. Diego el Professor, the professor has arrived, said Vicente, the caretaker of the Heidelberg Center for Latin America on the phone. Which one, I asked, Don Francisco. Ask him in. Two minutes later, Professor Orego appeared in my office. Moments after that, he was drinking a cup of tea. It was early evening. As he always started his classes punctually, that's rather an exception in Chile, we had nearly half an hour to talk about the program and other issues of mutual interest. 
It was no coincidence that Vicente had singled him out from the many professors and researchers who frequent our institute as El Profesor. He had sensed that this friendly, unpretentious, and always formally dressed man would be of vital importance to the Heidelberg Center. He was not wrong. It was thanks to Professor Orego that the master's course in international law, conceived as a double degree program, came into being. In 2003, he persuaded his colleague and friend, Professor Rüdiger Wolfram, director of the Max Planck Institute of Comparative Public Law and International Law, to develop an ambitious study program to be taught in Santiago and in Heidelberg. The two scholars swiftly put together the curriculum and presented it to the various parties involved. Whereas things went smoothly in Chile, both the Law Department of the University of Chile and the Institute of International Studies approved of the proposal. In Heidelberg, Professor Wolfram faced fierce resistance from some members of the Faculty of Law. For them, this initiative, dreamed up in the Max Planck Institute, did not correspond to the faculty's strategic plans for the future. Furthermore, the faculty was determined to maintain the status of the German language in jurisprudence, meaning that classes should not be held in English. Perhaps, most importantly, the heavy teaching load offered no provision for sending faculty members to Chile. It took Wolfram, with support from Rector Hommelhoff, many months to overcome this impasse. In the end, the Faculty of Law agreed on awarding the master's degree, but only under the condition that the Max Planck Institute was responsible for both administration and teaching. Francisco, who had watched this conflict incredulously from the sidelines, <laughs> called me to talk about the outcome. He was both pleased and relieved that we could finally go ahead with the LLN. I still remember his conclusion. Walter, there are better ways to waste one's time than faculty politics. He may not have liked it, but he knew how to play the game perfectly. The fact that two prestigious law faculties that hitherto had had so little contact had decided to embark on a joint master's program represented and still represents a masterpiece in the establishment of international academic cooperation. In addition to his experience in faculty politics, Francisco made perfect use of his diplomatic skills. He invited the most important opponent of the law department in Heidelberg, an internationally renowned expert on European law, for lunch, and the outcome was astounding. As both scholars later told me, they had a highly inspiring and stimulating discussion regarding different fields of international and European law before tackling the master's program. This led to Francisco's German colleague changing his mind. Indeed, since then, he has been a keen advocate of the LLM in international law. Many years later, in 2016, I believe it was, I read that Francisco had been ranked number two worldwide as arbitrator in commercial law disputes, and I thought to myself that he had shown this gift at the lunch table as early as 2004. Congratulating him on this distinction, I asked him who was number one. A lady from Geneva, he said. She's an excellent arbitrator, and she has also very good collaborators. Francisco, however, preferred to work on his own, and not only in the 22 cases analyzed by the authors of this study. In the same ranking of Allen and Overy, he was recognized as being number one in citation worldwide. In the 20 years he was with us, Jenny, the assistant of his friend's law firm, where he rented an office, told me. We manned the phone and sometimes helped him to download or scan documents. 
And of course, he did like his cup of tea. He must have been extremely disciplined and well organized to be able to produce that much work, I said. He certainly was, came the reply. He would arrive early in the morning before the rest of us and was still at his desk when everybody else had left. I always told the cleaners not to disturb him, she added. <laughs> Returning to the LLM, I'll spare you the details of university regulations in Santiago and Heidelberg. The fact that Heidelberg awards the degree of Master of Laws in International Law and Santiago awards the degree of Magister in Derecho Internacional, Inversiones, Comercio y Arbitraje, Investment, Trade and Arbitration, may tell you that there was much room for discussion, debate and friendly fire. Fortunately, in late 2003, departments for quality assurance and accreditation did not yet exist at both universities. Otherwise, we would never have succeeded in launching the program in April 2004. Quality, however, was guaranteed by these two highly experienced directors who employed excellent teaching staff on both sides of the Atlantic, as well as only admitting those students with an excellent record in their law studies. Francisco patiently presided over the three-hour meetings of the admissions committee and often commented with loving irony, never with sarcasm, on some gems in the motivation letters and letters of reference. We were often baffled by applications from graduates of Latin American University we had never heard of before. Francisco read one that reference written by a law professor from one of these universities he knew and said, if this applicant is recommended by my dear colleague, this student will be an asset to the program. Whatever legitimate student complaints arose concerning the performance of teaching stuff, he did not hesitate to take colleagues off the list, regardless of faculty position and reputation. This rectitude also stood out in financial matters. A week after his classes, at the very latest, we would receive his invoice. Honorarium with the stress on the first two syllables is probably a more adequate expression for the modest sum being paid to professors in our master's courses. In spite of this, Francisco, unlike myself, has never been late with his invoices. Another habit of his, not that common among his compatriots, was that he always returned a call, no matter which part of the globe he happened to be in. Francisco was an excellent host, too. He usually invited colleagues for lunch at the golf club Los Leones, where he was a member, even though he didn't play golf himself. A large number of professors and researchers of the LLM had the pleasure of being treated by him to a delicious meal in a wonderful environment served by elderly waiters who, as he humorously explained, would write down the order, but then, more often than not, would appear with meals that nobody had asked for. <laughs> At the end of 2007, once he was sure that the LLM course was well established, he resigned as its director. In the same year, on the occasion of the inauguration of the Heidelberg Center's new building, Rector Hommelhoff distinguished him with the Medal of Merit of Heidelberg University and appointed him honorary director of the master's program. Francisco Rego passed the baton to Professor Maria Teresa Infante, who has strongly supported this program right from its creation and served as its, Chilean, uh, as its director from 2008 to 2016, when she was appointed Chilean ambassador to the Netherlands. Subsequently, I asked Francisco to resume the directorship. He hesitantly accepted, but only under the condition that Andrea Lucas, who has served as academic coordinator of the LLM since 2005, would assist him. 
In retrospect, I have pangs of remorse about my proposal, which added some more dates to an already tight agenda. In late 2017, I met Professor Thomas Pfeiffer, director at the Institute for Comparative Law, Conflicts of Laws, and International Business Law in Heidelberg. He had recently been appointed director of the LLM, as he had been the key figure in the integration of the LLM into the law faculty after Professor Wolfram's successor decided to cancel the Max Planck Institute's responsibility for this program. We both agreed that the debt of gratitude of the University of Heidelberg to Professor Francisco Rego Vicunia was enormous, since he was the one who had initiated the binational LLM course in international law, the first of its kind in Chile. It has served as a model for many binational programs that followed and has thus contributed tremendously to the interna internationalization of Chilean universities. In 2017, there were more than 200 graduates from over 30 countries, most of them in high position in ministries, international organizations, chambers of commerce, and international law firms. From the perspective of Heidelberg's Faculty of Law, his contribution to international law was incalculable, and he therefore more than deserved a doctor honoris causa. Back in Santiago, I rang Francisco to tell him that we were updating our website and needed his CV and list of publications. Two days later, I found his email and unwisely pressed the print button connected to the, to the small printer on my desk rather than the large printer downstairs. His list of publication was endless. Countless narrowly typed pages which I had to remove individually. I rang Francisco and told him how impressed I was. He said laughing, don't worry, I inflated the amount as much as I could. <laughs> I sent his email to Professor Pfeiffer, wishing him, wishing him luck with reading all these books and articles as he had to present his report to the faculty council for the honoris causa proposal. Sadly, Shortly afterwards, Andrea Lucas informed me that Francisco was seriously ill and in need of a high-risk heart surgery, which thankfully he survived. Some time after this, he invited me for lunch at his golf club. I found him sitting at a table on the terrace with his back to the entrance. When I reached the table, I was shocked by his appearance. The man I knew so well and valued as a friend had lost weight, he seemed much smaller than before, and his voice had become soft and faltering. Nevertheless, he was still optimistic, and the following few phone calls suggested that he was making good progress. Unfortunately, he took up traveling again. One of these trips, uh, leading him to Heidelberg, where he was on the board of directors of the Max Planck Foundation, directed by his old friend Rüdiger, or Rudy, as he called him, Wolfram. Sorry. And then, tragically, we were informed that his illness had become critical, and later, that he had passed away. The congregation at the mass that took place shortly afterwards in a kind of huge modern cathedral, resembled a who's who of the Chilean legal universe and of Chile's civil society. When I discovered that the Faculty of Law cannot award the title Dr. Honoris Causa post mortem, I felt deeply upset that we had not come up with this proposal earlier. A few weeks after his funeral, his son Francisco contacted me with the surprising news that his father had decided to donate his Library of International Law to the Heidelberg Center, asking me to collect the books from his office. The following morning, with the center on, in the passenger seat, I set off to get the books. In stark contrast to the ultra-modern skyscraper it was situated in, 
Francisco's office reflected his personality. It was modest in size, had a large desk, some empty bookshelves, and two chairs. Everything personal had been taken out. Only the boxes with the books remained. A rather depressing sight. We loaded the boxes into the car and drove back in silence. Se fue el profesor. The professor has gone, but not for us. He left us not only his books, but also so many memories of a truly exceptional man. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Echo. Uh, the next speaker uh, is known to most in the room, uh, is Ambassador and Professor um, Maria Teresa Infante Caffi, Ambassador to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and, and, and the former uh, President of the Chilean Society of International Law. And, uh, and she has been doing, and she is doing, uh, just like the maestro that we are celebrating today, a lot about the promotion of international law and the promotion of her country um, going by the law. And, um, and uh, in fact, uh, Maria Teresa will precisely tell us about the contribution to the promotion and dissemination of international law. Um, through the Institute of International Law at the University of Chile by uh, Professor Francisco Rego. You have got the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, I feel so impressed by the words that have been said by Walter that I don't know if I can add new ideas or new perspectives, but I try to do my best. Dear Soledad, dear family of Francisco Rego Vicuña, uh, I remember when I met uh, your children, and you were not the adults you are now, and we were sharing some moments in La Serena some years ago. Yes, not together, but very closely uh, related, and uh, in many other occasions. Uh, dear Ambassador, distinguished guests, uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging how difficult it is to differentiate the academic professor Orego Vicuña from the advisor the writer, the judge, or the arbitrator. It is a unique case of a person who could practice law as well as participate in the process of negotiating legal norms and regimes and convening meetings to discuss policies at the same time. A staunch analyst of the circumstances in which he lived and a well-disposed advisor. Claudio, we're not going to forget that he was also advising uh, on, many, on many occasions. No rhetoric, no complacency. That was his public personality. As all human work, his achievements may be perceived as the fruit of a knowledgeable person and a prolific author, most probably among the most productive persons. Soon, those who decide to continue with the reading of his articles and books will realize how much he enjoyed contradicting mainstream ideas, twisting assumptions, and differentiating between apparently well-established doctrines and postulates of the late hour. His latest writings show that he did not avoid questions related to somehow classical issues, such as the value of, the value of consent and the formation of customary law, a relevant question of our present times. Orego Icuña often referred to the ideas uh, postulated by the great jurist Prostrel Veil regarding what this author called as a trend towards a relative theory of international law. Behind the apparent simplicity of the title, the rel relative theory, there was a solid analysis of the wake of an international legal system where distinctions between soft law and existing law were seeking a new accommodation both in theory and in practice. It is apparent that this question continues to be present in current discussions as it entails essential elements related to the sources of international law and the way they are established and transformed. A step forward in the shaping of answers about the essential components of Jus Cogens, where the scholar Orrego Vicuña would also like to express his views. 
very personal ones sometimes. During his life, Francisco de Gubicuña had the honor of participating as an ad hoc judge in two cases that Chile faced before international tribunals. The first one before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea on the subject of stored fish stocks with the European Union, and subsequently on the issue of maritime delimitation raised by Peru before the International Court of Justice between 2008-2014. Both cases of high relevance in international law and for the Chilean foreign policy. These appointments imply the exercise of delicate functions that transcended the cases themselves. As it is well known in his opinions, Orrego Vicuña did not refuse to play a provocative role if necessary and to encourage thinking about how to seek a balanced view. This is clear in his well-structured, separate, partly <coughs> concurring and partly dissenting opinion as an ad hoc, ad hoc judge in the maritime dispute case Peru versus Chile. In this opinion, Orrego Vicuña put on view what could be one of the most notable characteristics of his whole career which was the resolve to explain difficult issues like the place of equity in maritime delimitation and the text of Article 74.1 and 83.1 of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, a subject he knew well as he was one of the persons who crafted personally the provision enshrined in said articles. Now, looking at his role and place in the academia, where his work transcends national audiences and reaches the highest positions, the legacy seems enormous by all standards. In this respect, I will refer to three aspects of his career that reflect his capacity to undertake multiple activities, always defiant to establish conventionalisms and willing to confront prejudgments. First, since 1974, the successful rebirth of the Institute of International Studies of the University of Chile. After the deep crisis that had affected the Institute, which was followed by the breakup of the national democracy. While Orrego Vicuña taught and inspired young disciples at the law school, from the institute itself, his power and influence at the university were projected and gave him space to project himself at length. Orrego Vicuña was able to give a new structure to this institution created in 1966, subject in its previous years to the fate of the convolutions of the contemporary times. To be a person devoted to the university in, come, in, in, come, in the coming years was very much the type of work that Orrego Vicuña liked and gave a, a, and showed an unlimited capacity to imagine how to add two and three and end up with ten. That was his ability as director. As an example, subjects, personalities of all sorts, policy issues, diverse views are well reflected in a work today forgotten or ignored, titled Chile, The Balanced View, edited in 1974. The date speaks by itself. In his year as director, he introduced the Philip C. Jess Lomut Court competition among non students and gave a multidisciplinary flavor to the studies on foreign policy. In this effort, he rescued the analysis on the insertion of Chile in the Pacific Rim and gave a modern shape to the studies of Antarctic resources and regimes. The same happened with the marine environment, the law of the sea, Latin American economic relations, liability emerging from environmental damage, all sorts of areas that paved the way to the ample world of investment arbitrations that he pursued afterwards, among others. Whatever the subject and its difficulties, there was a permanent characteristic, characteristic in the push he gave to collective studies on issues that were internationally debated and that could have a bearing in the case of Chile always a combination of theory with current issues, as well as diverse approaches harmonized in a way that converge throughout various perspectives. In times of lack of clarity and critical decisions, Francisco Regovicuña stood by the Institute, protecting pluralism and countering initiatives to dismantle this institution. That was a distinguished figure, feature in difficult moments. A distinguished feature in difficult moments. At this stage, I would like to say that Professor Alberto Van Clavere may be a better place to refer to this matter, and most probably also Pilar Almané, his successor as director of the Institute, and other academics who enjoyed his faithful friendship. In Chile and abroad, his guidance over a few students was crucial to define vocations, and he did not cease to sponsor successive generations 
of researchers and professionals to build a career of their own. His interest in new topics and an appetite for the cultural and historical underpinnings of different communities around the world was part of his wide reading of the social and political landscape. A second feature I would like to highlight is his lasting influence in developing solid ties with international academic institutions and the ability to build trust with the most varied types of persons in Chile and abroad, be they uh, historians, scientists, lawyers, or political scientists. This has been a salient characteristic of his work at the university, where he showed skills to resist pressures and to select appropriate partners. This feature is also reflected in the initiation of new enterprises. The early years of the, the MA program, Master in International Studies of the University of Chile. Then the Chilean Council on Foreign Relations and the joint LLM program between the University of Chile and the University of Heidelberg. The creativity of Orrego Vicuña is clearly reflected in this master's program, which is devoted to international law uh, and offered since 2004, and to which Walter has addressed the most uh, uh, precise and, um, and beautiful words. Selected spirits, like those of Professor Orrego Vicuña and Professor Rudy Wolfram, have given prestige to the universities involved. At the Council uh, on Foreign Relations, papers resulting from a group of, group of studies contributed in the 90s to identify core elements for special areas of Chilean foreign policy, such as the relations with neighboring countries, Antarctic policy and priorities in the insertion in the, of Chile in the global and regional economy. In the latter, the LLM program, Orrego Icuña never ceased to provide advice propose and construct a demanding and privileged program where Latin Americans and Germans, as well as other Europeans, work hand in hand. I could testimony his inventive, inventive capacity and the soft manner he approaches selected target without showing at the beginning his full capacities. No noise, sometimes a bit rebellious against established truth and self-imposed instructions. Along with these academic endeavors, his international career was always infiltrated with a deep interest in searching remote areas. That was shown in his participation as co-chair of the Chilean delegation to the Third United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea with Ambassador Sechers, and to propose their interesting ideas on non-derogable provisions that was not accepted, in particular with respect to common heritage of mankind in seabed mining, on the limitation, accepted. Treaties over time, accepted, agreed. And seabed regime elements, among other topics. As it has been recalled today, Francisco Rego Vicuña also taught international law at the Law School of the University of Chile and provided the university as a whole with the same seal of quality and tolerance, valued both nationally and internationally. He postulated the need to get to set solid networks, building relationships with personalities representing different groups of the international community, task with which he commenced at the Organization of American States, where his international career started to unfold, working together with who was a leading Latin American jurist of the time, now forgotten, Francisco Garcia Mador. And I had the opportunity to meet him, and he was an outstanding uh, Latin American jurist of his time. In his lessons, while in Chile or abroad, Francisco Rego Vicuña deployed not only independence and a, a, a very tough character, but also he was always able to look at practical issues. One of the consequences, the effect of this uh, um, endeavor is the well-equipped library that the Institute enjoys in the field of international law and international relations. In this sphere, Orrego Vicuña seemed attracted to the contribution of the scientific world to a better understanding of current political issues and, and was open to leave space to social scientists and legal experts able to bring fresh air in world and legal affairs. He was never a formalist. He was always looking at the substance and how to improve the elaboration and the uh, practice of international law. His fascination with natural, re natural regions also marked his life while on holidays or as a location of seminars, Easter Island, Iquique, 
Antarctica, Punta Arenas, and many others. A third characteristic is the one that transcends from his international role on political and legal matters since his uh, early professional time when his advice was sought by successive governments and institutions on matters related to emerging treaties and regimes, as well as on economic disputes, integration, law of the sea, and peaceful settlement of disputes, among others. Over the years, he would be appointed international arbitrator, ad hoc judge, and be consulted as expert in innumerable, innumerable opportunities, but he never lost contact with the Chilean community. He convened a series of working groups on international relations, as I have said, and legal matters, and the resulting uh, outcome of that work uh, had been elements that are already embodied in the Chilean Antarctic policy, in some oceanic uh, uh, aspects of our ocean policy, and many other issues. Uh, this was that, that feature was a highlight of his, of his career at the national level, with a noticeable intellectual capacity to relate different subjects. At the time of his direction at the Institute and afterwards, Orrego Cunha became known for his leadership and skills to promote and build up agreements in difficult circumstances. That is something that distinguishes him from uh, normal or some practitioners of law and even academics. He was able to, to work from inside the mediation process was a laboratory for that, very poorly studied in Chile, more treated in Argentina, and I think is still open uh, for analysis. That stamp was recognized in successive stages of his life and explains the multiplicity of his works and projects. I would recall one, among other activities, his participation in the Commission for Settlement of Controversies between Chile and the United States in the Letel Letelier Moffitt case a hot case whose decision was issued in January 1992. A deep reflection on applicable international law and its relationship with justice can be read in a separate and concurrent opinion joined to the decision adopted. It was a, a case that was very important to close the chapter with the United States and to look uh, uh, ahead uh, for in our foreign policy and in our international relations. On the other hand, his ability to execute projects led him to write and publish fundamental works that serve as undoubted reference in the Chilean Latin American bibliographic production. From a theoretical point of view, in his most recent years, and without shying away from substantive discussions, he entered into debates about consent, as I said, and Alberto Van Claveren highlighted the formation of customary law and dispute settlement. Only always rounding up central points in the same way, uh, we may find some analysis, a very fine analysis, a short one, uh, on the arbitration between the Philippines and China, and trying to uh, have a parallel, or to bring a parallel view as to how Argentina and Chile could settle a dispute with, with, uh, uh, with uh, many uh, political and legal underpinning elements and very difficult to, uh, to manage um, jointly. And he said some, he says something, it is a short reference in an article he prepared for the uh, celebration at the Law of the Sea Tribunal. It is, the question is not about the validity of, uh, of a line only, or about the application of international law. It's also a question of understanding which are the core interests of the parties and the definition of and the essential underlying issues that should reappear in any analysis. That was very interesting. Uh, uh, to, to, to see how sensitive he was. He, as it has been mentioned also, he was a prolific author, essay writer, and editor of classical, classic works in Spanish, English, and French. And I would like to conclude my uh, remarks uh, uh, by addressing uh, certain areas in which the actual projection of Francisco Rego can be uh, seen. His disposition to collaborate in critical situations and to provide legal and diplomatic services. That's one feature that is a consequence of his own, uh, the way he thought uh, the world should be uh, uh, assessed. In all this, he participated either as a leader of a team or as an expert. And it was noticeable that he provided consistency and commitment to all uh, the whole process. It was also the sign he showed as ambassador in London, 
with London without ceasing in his effort to contribute to the democratic reunion in his country and to foster reflections on the present and future of Chile's Chilean foreign, rela foreign relations. Francisco Reguicuña was also part of a generation that sought the creative and dynamic implementation of the Treaty of Peace and Friendship with Argentina that was adopted in 1984. Celebrated under the, uh, the mediation Aegis and the, the end of a long process of negotiation preceded by dramatic days. Thus, in the 80s and the beginning of the 90s, he contributed decisively to generate ideas for the construction of a new relationship with the neighboring country through concrete proposals of cooperation and integration that are absolutely uh, present nowadays. Again, international law in its various areas of application would play a leading role. On the other side, on the Antarctic, a series of seminars and lectures he organized led to consider different angles of the negotiations of natural resources and the connection of these matters with the protection of the environment, uh, including the perspectives of the countries of the Southern Hemisphere. This matter posed questions as to the characteristics and nature of the Antarctic Treaty, where Orrego Vicuña supported the dual approach of a country that claims to have sovereign rights, as is the case of Chile and others, but fully participate in an international regime. He also provided essential advice to resolve questions about the protection of the Antarctic environment and the issue of mineral resources, while not being a negotiator himself of the regime. In his, thought, in his thoughts, there was always a permanent connection between ongoing negotiations or debates and the thinking about what was the, their significance and contribution to the real world. How to coexist with claimant states and non-claimant states. How to overcome domestic issues and domestic legislation issues that came uh, up during the uh, discussions of, of the approval of certain re protocols and, and, and uh, supplementary instruments. The same may be said about his participation in investment arbitrations of related matters, but I'm not going to dwell <laughs> into that because there will be more, more uh, knowledgeable people addressing those issues. But I would like to say two words before finishing. Pertin it is very pertinent to recall that uh, Professor Rego Vicuña taught a course on the exclusive economic zone at the Academy of International Law well before the entry into force of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and he identified the major issues of this unique maritime zone. I would like to thank him for the invitation to contribute at an earlier stage with a study for a previous book on the <coughs> subject and to look at the dispute settlement system applicable to the disputes in the economic zone and its bearing on the legal nature of this sui generis zone. And it was fascinating to have a, like a mirror whether the dispute settlement mechanisms that are applicable in the economic zone to some extent uh, support or not support the nature of the economic zone, which is based on the assumption that there are sovereign rights, but not over space, but uh, uh, functional areas and functional activities. That is uh, something that is very salient in his mind. Second, I would like to recall uh, that he was involved with the, the, the Academy of International Law, the Hay Academy of International Law, through his friendship with so, those leading and most reputed jurists, René Jean Dupuis, Daniel Bardonnet, and the successors uh, of, of, uh, uh, in, in their positions. Dupuis, who wrote and who translated the work on Alejandro Alvarez, a, a personality, quite a personality in international law, uh, uh, who was also brought to the attention of Chile by Francisco Rubicuña very many years after he had uh, lost the position as, or he has finished his function as a judge of International Court of Justice, and Daniel Bardonet, who was a leading advisor, not only of many countries, but of our neighboring country, Argentina. But it never, never affected the friendship that Orrego Vicuña had with Daniel Bardonet, and I was uh, uh, witness of that, uh, of that friendship at that time. And with this, I would like to end my, my words and to share a voice of those who say that Francisco Orrego Vicuña was a genuine public servant, and that 
with his departure, the international legal community has lost an active supporter of the role and place of international law, which was open to discuss whenever necessary to establish a new level of commitment and effectiveness. Thank you very much. We thank you very much for the usual depth and, and, and clarity. Um, there is a point, a, a, a tiny point that I will take from your presentation, just because it will usher us into the next uh, um, 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 presentation. Uh, the tribute that um, Francisco Rego Vicuña paid to the Cuban lawyer, uh, Garcia Amador, he wrote in, published in 1994, sorry, I think that was, yeah, 1994, the distinguished contribution of Garcia Amador to the development of international law in the Inter-American Law Review. And this brings us to the next uh, presentation, just because the next presentation is going to be on the impact of his Latin American cultural identity in his scholarship and professional career. Uh, the next speaker is Ambassador Professor um, uh, Jimena Fuentes. Um, she shares with Francisco Rego Vicuña a PhD in the UK on the law of or transboundary water courses. The seminal works have been published on the British Yearbook of International Law, 1998. And that is how we became friends through transboundary, our interest on transboundary water courses. And uh, currently, uh, Jimena is the agent for Chile before the International Court of Justice in the uh, Bolivia Chile case over precisely the Silala River. And currently, also, is the head of the directorate for state borders and boundaries of Chile, and a topic which is extremely acute in Latin America, and now we came to understand that it can become acute also in Europe. So we, we may exchange your expertise. As much as in the 60s and 70s, uh, Latin America was so very much dependent on the progress being made in in, in Europe and European integration, perhaps time has come that now the reverse will apply. So without further ado, and uh, silly things being said by me, I give you the floor, Jimena. Thank you very much, uh, Attila, for, for this introduction. And I think that the standard is very high after the words of my two predecessors. Um, so, I, as I knew that this will happen, I try to, I will try to be a little bit provocative <laughs> with my own speech. Well, first, first I would like to thank uh, Ambassador Gallagher for the invitation and also two of the main organizers of this uh, event. First, Mr. Alejandro Escobar, um, Alejandro, he was my coach for the Jessup competition when I was at law school, so I always regarded him as a sort of a genius. Uh, and now we are colleagues. <laughs> and Miss Pasarate, we also met at the law school. I'm older, so she was an assistant um, at that time, uh, and a promising star, in fact. Um, well, and I'm very happy also to be among friends here. Um, here you have some members of the Chilean academic community. In fact, here you have sort of 80% of the Chilean academic <laughs> community because we are a small community, okay? And we are all friends. Professor Maria Teresa Infante, uh, Alberto Fanclaveren, Claudio Troncoso, we are colleagues at the Department of uh, Public International Law at the University of Chile, Pasarate. And also we have, um, we have some students, uh, like Agustin Searle, that is uh, today and now studying here at LSE. So we have a sort of a range of the different generations. 
involved in international law. And that is, that is, um, that is, that is a very good thing. I think that Francisco Rego would be very happy to see that his colleagues are here, but also the, the new generations, and that he was able to form uh, new generations of academics and practitioners. Well, Francisco Rego was um, a Chilean lawyer and an academic. He, he studied at the Faculty of Law of the University of Chile. His father was a diplomat, hence he, when he was young, he lived in different countries, and for that reason, I guess, he spoke very good French and English uh, besides his native Spanish. He was not, as we all know, he was not neutral in political terms. Um, under today's standards, he might be called a conservative. Um, but he was also a liberal uh, in respect of uh, his economic uh, and, and, and his views about the, the functioning of the market. He was ambassador of the Republic of Chile to the UK during the Chilean dictatorship. And yet, he worked as an advisor, as everyone has said here, for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and for the governments uh, of Chile after the reestablishment of democracy. He wrote on many subjects, Antarctica, the law of the sea, environmental law, immunities, commercial arbitration, investment arbitration, and of course, something that is very interesting, the relations between Chile with its neighboring countries, <laughs> which we all care about here, uh, all the professors here uh, attending this seminar. He became a distinguished arbitrator in investment arbitration, particularly exit arbitration. He was also appointed judge ad hoc before the ICJ in the Peru versus Chile maritime dispute. He was the mentor of many international lawyers that today work for the government of Chile, but also for foreign governments that work in law firms like Alejandro Escobar, or for academics like Claudio, who is my boss at the University of Chile at the department. Some of these former students are here today, um, and, and after his death, uh, we are all participating in this seminar in London at LSE to pay tribute to his great contribution to international law. Now, when I was asked to speak in the seminar, I saw the opportunity to invite the audience to think beyond Francisco Rego's personal contribution as a diplomat, as an academic, and as a teacher. And to think about what it means that a Latin American professor of international law becomes one of the most active practitioners in the field of international law, putting forward his views about international law and about international politics. Um, I, would, I would like to say that when he decided cases as an arbitrator, when he um, act as a member of the administrative tribunal of the World Bank and of the International Monetary Fund, when he worked as a member of the governing board of ICCA and as a diplomat, um, he was contributing from a Latin American perspective, despite the fact that he was a sort of a citizen of the world. And, and that is very, very interesting because it is a little bit rare to find someone coming from a distant part of the world having so much influence. Uh, in my opinion, his active involvement with so many international institutions that apply international law means 
that he was able to transform his academic views into international law proper, into living international law. As a judge, as an arbitrator, he became a, quotation marks, a source of international law, and therefore he had a tangible impact on international law. It is often said that international law is Eurocentric, and indeed, international law is a Eurocentric discipline. The history of international law is Eurocentric. The creation of international law is Eurocentric, and the study of international law <coughs> is Eurocentric. And there are enough academic writings explaining why international law is this accumulation of rules and principles created mainly by European countries to serve their own interests. This is what we learn when, we, when reading so many articles and books about the history of international law. And now the question is, um, if we want to move, move forward, uh, what should we do to change this situation? Francisco Rego, I think, has the answer. And maybe he was not aware that he has had or has the answer. And the answer is, well, we need more lawyers coming from the peripheries of the world to engage actively as practitioners in the field of international law. In this sense, Francisco Orego is and should be an example for all of us. Indeed, the first step to make in international law a field of law that may really include the principles that come from a variety of legal systems of the world, from the various different legal court cultures, is that the voice of lawyers and academics that come from those legal cultures has to come to the forefront. Sometimes it is thought that the contribution of lawyers and academics coming from non-European or non-first world countries is interesting in so far as they expose uh, the views of the third world. Of course, the experience of colonialism and the division between capital exporting countries and countries exporting com commodities explains in many respects why international wor law works as it works. But Francisco Rego is not a representative of this trend of third world views on international law. And yet, he has contributed to show that international law is not the sole product of European countries. Um, Francisco Orrego, in my view, has demonstrated that small countries also think global. Non-European countries also need international law to achieve their goals in a pragmatic manner. Of course, small countries do not want to be dominated by colonial powers, but they want to obtain the benefits of the exploitation of their, of their natural resources. And for that reason, they need to have friendly relations with their neighbors. They need certainty about their international boundaries. They need to act jointly and cooperate with other countries in their region in order to strengthen their positions. They need the rule of law to prevail within their own legal systems. They need to avoid interve intervention by third countries, and they need to be strongly opposed to the use of force. This is the rationale that inspires the international policy of a small developing countries of Latin America. When Francisco Rego wrote about all these topics of international law, he was advancing the views that in his opinion were the better ones 
to advance the interests of countries like Chile in attaining economic growth and promoting the rule of law within Chilean society. Therefore, Francisco Rego was not only working for himself as an academic, as a practitioner, he was working for what he thought was the better model of governance for the international society as a whole. In that sense, he was a real public servant, a real public servant of his country, and we could say a real public servant of the world. Um, I may try to demonstrate this by reviewing some of his articles and books, um, in fact, only two, because I know that uh, lunchtime is uh, close, so I, <laughs> only two out, uh, um, books. Um, one about international dispute settlement, the one that Sam uh, referred to, uh, and the other about the regulation of high seas fisheries a topic very important for Chile as well. In 2001, Francisco Rebo delivered the Lauterbach Memorial Lectures at the Lauterbach Research Center for International Law at the University of Cambridge. These lectures were collected in the book, published by Cambridge University Press called Dispute Settlement in an Evolving Global Society, Constitutionalization, Accessibility, and Privatization. In the introduction, Professor Orrego states that there is a tension between centralized international action and the role of regional organizations, between universalism and regionalism in the settlement of international disputes. When he, what he suggests as the most advisable system of dispute settlement in the international society is a centralized, decentralized dispute resolution system for the international community. He admits that some functions ought to be centralized, such as the authorization of the use of force. But he also calls for a sphere of, of freedom where businesses and private actors may move freely and solve their disputes in a system of what he calls private justice. As you see, he took a clear stance with regard to the relationship between the state and the private sector because he thought that that was better at large for the people, including the peoples living in developing countries. Another interesting area in which he worked was the law of the sea. Francisco Rego, as everyone has already uh, reminded us, was a senior member of the Chilean delegation in UNCLOS, UNCLOS III, during the entire negotiation. His book on the changing international law of high seas fisheries is a book about the evolution of the principles and rules governing high seas fisheries putting forward the views of a country like Chile, which needs to protect its transboundary natural resources from, from depletion. When it comes to the protection of coastal interests in the conservation of fisheries, Francisco Orrego stresses the ability of international law to achieve an accommodation of interests that in the end plays in favor of all the parties concerned. International regulation appears as the solution to the tragedy of the commons uh, problem. And he has no problem in defending unilateral action by coastal states. In fact, he defended unilateral action by Chile, by Argentina, and Canada. As a pragmatic behavior of these states that in the end has been, as Orego states, a major factor inducing the attainment of solutions that had otherwise proven uh, effusive. For us, international lawyers coming from Latin America, for us, academics teaching in Latin American universities, Francisco Orrego shows 
that the future of our countries does not depend only on domestic politics and domestic legislation, but it depends to a great extent in the development of international law principles and rules. Therefore, we need to be active participants in the various fora at which these principles and rules are being discussed and in the end created. In fact, Francisco Orego's legacy is that he taught us that we need to be academics and lawyers with a political view and that we need to become global. Uh, I think that uh, all the Chileans that are here, particularly the, the younger ones, would agree with me that he, this is his main uh, legacy and we are thankful for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jimena. Very, very, very deep, very thoughtful presentation and very thought-provoking rather than provocative. And uh, uh, as much as we managed not to stand in the way of coffee break, we do not, we are not minded to stand in the way of our luncheon break. So I am in the hands of the organizers whether you want to leave room for a couple of comments or anything. We cannot run late. So we can close the session thanking the panelists and, and the audience for being there. Questions? No questions, not allowed. <laughs> not allowed. Thank, thank you all. See you later. Capaz que seguimos después. Seguimos después hablando, ¿no? Porque hay dos. Aquí.
I'm going to leave it there.
Where would you like us to sit? Okay. Thank you. We've agreed that I will be very brief. Yeah, he will be longer than he says, and I will be shorter than he says. So, I've really got nothing much to say because everything's been said already. It was all said by Ross in the very first Nothing else. Perspectives are important. Ladies and gentlemen, could we please ask you back to your seats? Very hard. Yeah, I'll do that. These are clean glasses. Okay, so I got one from up there. <laughs> I think, so. yes, I'm definitely going first because that will leave Alan lots and lots of time. Uh, investment law and comparative uh, contract law. Okay. Uh, it's the sort of things I don't do. <laughs> the sort of things that uh, Francisco did do. Did, and uh, that's how I met him as well. Uh, I do not know much about the law of the sea or the Antarctica, but I'm um, filling it as a joke. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the disadvantage of choosing a German chair to a panel is that being already a minute and a half late is uh, difficult for me. So let's try to keep on time. Um, I have the honor to chair this panel now, which is dedicated to the works of uh, Professor Rigo Vicuña and the Law of the Sea and Antarctica. And it is actually very interesting for someone also like me, an academic who has evolved quite a bit and has started from the same point basically as uh, Professor Orrego Vicuña, which was the law of economic integration. He worked on economic integration in Latin America from the very beginning. Um, I started, my first article I ever wrote was the law of integration in the Mercosur, which by then was already like the third iteration of attempts to find regional integration in Latin America. So um, I'm a little bit of his grandson in that respect. Um, but the interesting see, part is to see the trajectory of the development of an academic who starts... It is, it is on. It's, it's on. Yes. I probably switched it off. Um, the interesting see, part is to see how interests evolve and spread out and has been said and, and, and testimonied in such different and, and nice ways of how Professor Rodrigo Vicuña was a real solid generalist who knew a lot about many specialized areas. But of course, that takes an enormous amount of investment in terms of time and learning and a certain humility to each time start again in a new area until a certain oversight comes in and a broader understanding, which then allows going from higher principles down to the specialist areas. And if one looks at this list of publications in the early years, it is dominated by the uh, uh, law of inter economic integration and the law of the seas comes on later. But of course there is a line that makes a whole lot of sense. As soon as you start integrating and you start looking at an internal market structure, if you start thinking about the rule of law among different nations who want to do commerce together, navigation comes, borders comes up, and of course the law of the sea is 
uh, uh, then a, a, a logical extension to that if you look into <coughs> international law. And then the law of the Antarctic, which he then developed mostly here at the LSE, is again a logical uh, expansion. But it also interweaves directly with the history, uh, of course, in which uh, Francisco Arrigo Vicuña lived. Um, the Beagle dispute was, of course, one of his main achievements uh, of being able to actually bring about a solution, a peaceful solution here, which was about boundaries, it was about the law of the seas as well, and of course it was next to Antarctica, and it was like a logical step to move on to see, well, what happens about the international community that seeks to exploit the richness of Antarctica? We have to find rules for this. So this then made up for quite an important part of his work and where he has been pioneering and really uh, setting standards for, for many generations to follow. I'm therefore delighted that today we have two eminent speakers. Today we have on the one hand Sir Michael Wood, who is a member of the International Law Commission and a former legal advisor um, of the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and of course a barrister at 20 Essex. And we have Professor Alan Boyle, barrister at Essex Court Chambers, yet another one from Essex Court Chambers, Emeritus Professor of Public International Law of the University of Edinburgh. <coughs> we shall start with Sir Michael. Please. Is the microphone working? Uh, well, thank you very much, Jan. I'll call you Jan because it's easier than <laughs> calling you by your real name. Um, <laughs> members of the family, excellences, I think that's the right order. Ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be asked to say a few words on this occasion in honor of uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Francisco Orego Vicuña. Um, I'd like to thank the family and all those who've been involved in arranging this. Uh, Alejandro Escobar, uh, the, the Embassy of Chile, the Ambassador of Chile, and of course uh, LSE and, and others. I think it's remarkable that this event is taking place in, in London. Um, Ambassador Jimena Fuentes pointed out that there are a lot of Chilean academics here. She said 80% of <laughs> those in the field of public international law and Chilean, Chilean, I've been told off for saying Chilean, I think it's American, Chilean students. Uh, but I think for those of us who are international lawyers based in London, we regard it as uh, uh, a very good thing that uh, it's been, it was decided to, to host this event, to have this event here in London. It does a, an honor, perhaps, to, to London as a center of international law as well. Um, as I've said, um, I've known, I knew Francisco for a long time. He was a very good friend and colleague. Uh, I respected him very highly as an international lawyer, both as a writer and as a practitioner. I didn't know him uh, as a teacher, uh, but I'm sure that he excelled in, in that as well. Uh, I always appreciated his, his good humor, which was mentioned yesterday at the, the reception. Um, I think that um, one thing that I've been really struck by listening to, to the very interesting statements all day is how consistent they have been. They have painted a picture uh, that's entirely consistent of this person and a picture that I think we all recognize. Uh, and that's a very good thing. I think today's uh, proceedings have or show uh, just how much Francisco did, how many circles he moved in. And I just wanted to add a few more before turning very quickly to, to the law of the sea. Uh, firstly, uh, he was a colleague in my barrister's chambers at 20 Essex Street, now for some reason rebranded as 20 Essex Chambers. Uh, he was an active member of Chambers. He would visit us whenever he was in London. And I know members of Chambers much appreciated the fact that we saw him in Chambers. He contributed by email whenever there were important decisions that went out to members of Chambers. So although he was uh, usually a very long way, long way away. His sound advice and his wisdom uh, were much appreciated. Um, the, we, we also met frequently in Heidelberg, and by that I mean Heidelberg, Germany, not Heidelberg, Santiago. 
Uh, it was very good to see Rudiger Wolfram here yesterday, and I'm sure we all regret that he was unable to be with us today because he and Francisco uh, did so much uh, together. Uh, I'd like to mention that uh, Francisco and I were both on the advisory board of the Max Planck Encyclopedia of Public International Law. Um, from about 2002, we had a number of meetings at which we chose the entries, we chose the uh, initial uh, writers for those entries, and over a number of years, Francisco uh, played an important and crucial role in the establishment of what I think is, is a very important resource for, for international lawyers, the Max Planck uh, Encyclopedia. Uh, he also contributed uh, two important entries to the encyclopedia, entries that are central to, to international law, the one on international claims and the one on mediation. And more recently, uh, we've been colleagues on the Scientific and Development Policy Advisory Committee of, it's very long, very German, uh, name of the Max Planck Foundation for International Peace and the Rule of Law. This is a new foundation, a Max Planck Foundation, which is a strange beast, animal, created by Rudiger uh, to conduct rule of law activities in places that are really very difficult. So they send uh, people in the field to South Sudan, to Sudan, um, to, to uh, a number of other places, Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, and, and they do really good work. And that is something that Francisco was very interested in, in the practical side of, of the rule of law. Uh, he was the chair of that scientific committee, uh, and sad to say he did come to it, as was mentioned earlier today, uh, far too soon after having uh, his very serious operation. Uh, and we were all uh, amazed at his dedication that he came within a few days, within a couple of weeks, I think, of, of a remarkable operation to come from Santiago to Heidelberg, which shows his devotion to, to the work of, of that committee. Um, now, I was going to mention a number of interesting things he's done, but of course everybody else has mentioned them as well. Talk of his, uh, his article on mediation immediately reminds one of the papal mediation in the Beagle Channel case, but uh, Ambassador Maria Teresa Infante has already mentioned that, and, and so have others. Uh, so I'll just mention a couple of personal uh, involvements that I had in the Beagle Channel case, because it was the very first thing I did when I joined the Foreign Office in uh, about 1970. The very first thing I did was to go to Bern to negotiate an agreement on privileges and immunities for the arbitration, the ill-fated, rather ill-fated arbitration uh, in the Beagle Channel case. And, and I thought life was wonderful. We traveled first class, we had an excellent meal. We didn't really have to do any work. I thought diplomacy was, was excellent. So I owe a lot to the Beagle Channel uh, and its case. Um, then I had the, uh, the honor, um, a rather um, difficult task, of delivering the award to the two embassies in London because the treaty said that it became effective upon delivery to the two embassies in London. So I had to get into a taxi with two copies of the award. And uh, we had actually handed it to the ambassadors, or the charge of Argentina and the ambassador of Chile, uh, two or three days before so they could prepare their press uh, releases and the like. So they knew the outcome. So I was a bit worried that when I got to the embassy of uh, Argentina, I might find it locked and I would be unable to <laughs> deliver it. It was too heavy to put through the, the letterbox. Um, but, but they actually opened the door and uh, the, the charge d'affaires was extremely polite. This was at about nine o'clock in the morning and then I go to the embassy of Chile and Ambassador Begunio welcomes me, hugs me, offers me champagne and I had a very different welcome from there. But of course, in the end, it required uh, the papal skill and indeed the skill of, uh, of Francisco to, to really resolve the matter. 
And I believe, as, as was said uh, earlier today, that it has helped to build uh, good neighborly relations between um, Argentina and Chile. And Francisco's involvement in that um, was slightly more important than, than my own. I was also going to go on and mention the Letelier and Moffat uh, Arbitration Commission or Commission, uh, which decided the amount, I think, of compensation to be paid. Uh, it was limited to that, but that was a very delicate matter. Uh, but that's been mentioned by others, so I only want to recall that it was my former uh, boss at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, Sir John Freeland, who was the chairman of that commission as I recall. So it was altogether another example of good cooperation between the United Kingdom and, uh, and Chile and the United States. So um, turning to the law of the sea, well, it's all really been, been said, I'm afraid, because most speakers have referred to um, Francisco and the law of the sea. Uh, but the obvious point to make is the role that uh, Chile and uh, Francisco in particular played in developing the, the central deal, really, at UNCLOS, developing the 200-mile exclusive economic zone. We all know the history. I don't have to repeat, but we have the 200-mile the territorial sea, I think, declarations from the late 1940s, we have the um, famous, I nearly said infamous, Declaration of Santiago of 1952 that I learned a lot about in the Peru-Chile case. Um, and Chile's role was obviously very important and, and critical at the conference. Um, Chile had a special position. I do recall there was a thing called the Presential Sea, which uh, Francisco... I think may have been the only person in the world who understood <laughs> the presential C. It reminds me of what Palmerston said about the Schleswig-Holstein matter. Um, he was the only person in the world alive who still understood it. But Michael, there uh, were four people who understood the Schleswig-Holstein question, but yes. three of them were dead. One was mad, one was, yes, anyway. <laughs> I wasn't going to go into all the details. Uh, but I do think that uh, this showed, obviously the history indicates that uh, Chile's role at the conference in contributing to the, um, the final um, or the a compromise of the exclusive economic zone was very important and it required uh, great skill and great balance and a very reasonable approach because uh, states were very committed to their 200-mile uh, territorial seas, and others were very committed to their three-mile territorial seas, and getting the two to come together required great skill on the part of really just a few individuals of whom Francisco uh, was certainly one. And it's a compromise which has stood the test of time and, and stood it very well. Of course, practice developed while the conference was going on, but it required these, these uh, far-seeing see people at the conference to, uh, to, 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 to work on it. Now, other matters have been mentioned where Francisco was influential in the law of the sea. Um, we had mention of the deep sea bed. Uh, that also turned out to be not so successful a compromise, but time has, it has developed and, and has succeeded eventually, and I think uh, Francisco's view of economic relations and the importance of, uh, of private um, contribution, private, private company involvement, as well as uh, a good regulatory system, um, comes out in, in the eventual solutions on the deep sea bed with which he, he played a great role. You've got to remember how controversial that was in the 1970s, the era of the new international economic order and all that, it required great statementship to, to get to where we are today. Mention was also made of this morning of the, um, his contribution to um, the delimitation and dispute settlement provisions of UNCLOS, which is, um, they're, they're 
a brilliant uh, compromise that's completely meaningless and has worked perfectly because it basically said the law is what the courts say the law is and the courts have behaved quite sensibly in saying what the law is on the whole and um, we are where we are which that was a, dis a difference of opinion at the, the, uh, the conference which looked unbridgeable but it was bridged by by, by clever drafting and, and uh, imagination. And um, I think there again we owe a lot to, to, to Francisco. Now, um, I'll leave Antarctica to Alan, I think. Um, but I did want to say a word or two about Francisco's basic uh, philosophy of international law, which others have referred to, but my view is that he was very much um, a practitioner as well as um, somebody interested in theory. He was that ideal of a realist idealist or an idealist realist, I think, and that comes out in his writings. Um, he uh, just shortly before he passed away, I think he had completed um, a book which is about the balance of international law and this book is uh, reads like a general course and it's a summation of all his thinking and uh, it's the hope of uh, a number of us here in the room that this should be published it's, it's a substantial book I've read every word of it and I really appreciate it um, it's, it's a work that brings out the common sense of the man as well as the depth of his thinking about, about international law. Uh, and I'd just like to, well, I, I suppose one thing I ought to mention is his work as an ad hoc judge in the law of the sea, uh, though I won't say too much about the Peru-Chile case, having been on the wrong side. Uh, I apologize to all our Chilean uh, friends here for that, uh, and also for liking the result very much. Uh, but as an ad hoc judge, it was always a pleasure to stand before him and to read his uh, separate and dissenting opinion that was referred to this morning, but also his, was it a joint dissenting opinion with three other judges? Judge Shui is nodding uh, with a smile, so I think I'm right there. So, so th that was, was a very interesting role that he played as, as an ad hoc judge, though of course we shall never know what the real role was, because ad hoc judges never tell us what they, what they really got up to, unfortunately. Um, I think um, with that, I've said all I'm going to say, and I'll pass, pass the floor to Alan. Very Thank well. you very much. Very well, and uh, this gives me the occasion before moving on to Professor Boyle is, uh, and this, to the disclosure that some of you know, I'm a, I'm a born Peruvian citizen, so I hope this does not contribute to the complications. Please. Thank you, Professor klein yeah, I could well. pronounce it. Um, <laughs> anyway, thank you. May I, may I, first of all, thank the ambassador and the organizers of this uh, conference. Um, I wasn't expecting to be invited to participate. Uh, the invitation came out of the blue a few weeks ago. Uh, but I have to say, uh, Francisco Orego Vicuña, I regarded as a good friend. Uh, and I was delighted to have this opportunity to come and speak at this event. Um, I actually first met him when I was a very young lecturer. Indeed, I was probably still in short trousers, I would imagine. Um, I, just after he came to London as ambassador, because of course he was really moonlighting. He was in fact a PhD student, so he was, he was by day he was the ambassador, but I suspect that most of his time was devoted to doing his research. And since he had Professor Higgins, as it were, behind him, I have no doubt that he busied himself furiously as anybody who was being supervised or taught by Professor Higgins would have done. Actually, Rosalind didn't supervise him. He was in fact supervised by my co-author and good friend, uh, the late uh, uh, Patricia Burney, which is how, I, of course, I came to meet Francisco, uh, because I was appointed as his internal examiner. Now, this was actually the first PhD that I ever examined, and I had no idea. I, I, I didn't have a PhD 
I mean, in the good old days, you became a British academic without having one. I remember saying to my tutor at Oxford, should I, if I want to be an academic, John, should I, should I do a PhD? He said, Alan, what would you want to do a PhD for? You're amply well qualified. Don't waste your time on PhDs. So I had no idea what they were about. But anyway, I um, read his PhD, and it was very interesting. It was essentially on Antarctic minerals, but there was also quite a lot on the law of the sea. And as you would expect from Francisco, it was not narrow and technical. Uh, so there was quite a lot in there. Uh, and I think Derek Bowett was the external examiner, and he knew rather more about it than I did. But of course, the person who had written the thesis knew most of all about it, and it was an excellent uh, Viva. Uh, the thing that I think struck me, other than Francisco's considerable grasp of the subject, the thing that struck me at the time that I've always remembered was um, his courtesy and his kindness and his good humor. Uh, and that continued, I think, throughout our acquaintanceship. Uh, it was always a pleasure to meet him, and when eventually I made my way to Chile for a variety of reasons. There's a, there's a young lady at the back who's got something, some responsibility for luring me to Chile at some point. Yes, she's smiling back there. Uh, but when I, when I came, Francisco very kindly, he and his wife, and it's very nice to see you again, um, invited me to dinner. Uh, we had a wonderful dinner, um, and I'm sure that he would have hoped that there'll be a good glass of Cabernet Sauvignon uh, after this. But if there isn't, I'm sure we can all go off and generate one. But that certainly was how I first met Francisco, and we continued to cross paths ever after, and uh, it was always the same. Uh, he was always interested in what I was doing, and I was always interested in what he did, because he did interesting things. Um, I could even go on about the Beagle Channel arbitration, not perhaps at the slightly elevated level of Michael. I didn't actually deliver the, anything to anybody as a postman, but when I was in short trousers as a young lecturer, my professor, Ken Simmons, was, I think, the, the papal mediator, or whatever it was. He'd been appointed by the Pope to sort the whole thing out. So there would occasionally be meetings in his room, and I would be dragged along to observe what was going on and peer at maps, which certainly gave me an interest in becoming uh, a practitioner. So um, what am I going to talk about? Well, obviously, the areas that uh, Francisco and I shared an interest in were the law of the sea and Antarctica. Um, and I think one of the interesting things about his thesis, and this is, this is a point which is, I, I think, being made by others this morning. I'm sorry I arrived late, but I've picked up enough to see that there's a consistency here. Francisco did have a fundamental argument in his thesis and in his writings on law of the sea and Antarctica. Um, and his point was that they both required cooperative management in the interests of the international community as a whole, while at the same time accommodating and balancing the rights and interests of individual states. How those not always complementary objectives could be reconciled and achieved was, I think for him, one of the challenges thrown up by contemporary developments in international law uh, including, most obviously, uh, the adoption of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, and we've heard, as we've heard, uh, Francisco had an active role in that negotiation and in subsequent treaties. And uh, as others have said, uh, he was a professor who had a very real impact on the evolution of international law. Uh, he would have gone down very well indeed in the current assessment for academic research in the United Kingdom because he clearly had impact. He was not an armchair theorist, but he was good at putting practical problems in a broader theoretical framework, and he had a very keen sense of policy objectives. Um, so hardly surprisingly in his writings, Francisco sought to find innovative solutions to the problems that he identified. And one of those solutions was the so-called uh, presenthial sea, adopted by Chile in the 19. 90s. It is true that none of us understood it, um, but some of us did encounter it. Um, Chile, uh, following the adoption of the Law of the Sea Convention, Chile and many other coastal fishing states had obviously proclaimed a 200-mile EEZ that transferred most of the fish into national jurisdiction. But as Orego Vicuña had predicted, 
The transfer of control did not do away with the need for international cooperation because, of, of course, the fish knew nothing about the EEZ and they had this habit of straddling the EEZ and the high seas or straddling other people's EEZs. So they irritatingly uh, remained shared or common property in some sense in many instances. And this led, in the case of Chile, to problems with the Spaniards in particular of overfishing on the high seas adjacent to the Chilean EEZ. So Canada, which also shared the same problems and Chile, then briefly tried to deal with this by extending their jurisdiction beyond 200 miles. Now in the case of Chile, it wasn't a straight geographical extension of the EEZ. What Chile did was a wee bit cleverer than the Canadians. Um, what they did was to ban access to Spanish uh, sorry, to Chilean ports for the Spanish fishing vessels, which meant that they couldn't get the fish to market. Uh, it also meant, for reasons that will become evident, that the poor Spanish fishermen couldn't get a decent bath and clean clothes, and they had to go to Peru. They didn't like Peru. Peru was dirty by comparison to Chile. There are documents to prove it. I can I'll come back to that. So this was, this was a very clever way of getting at the Spaniards. And the other thing that Chile did was to negotiate a regional fisheries agreement from which third parties, uh, from which, as it were, non-regional states like the EU uh, were excluded. This produced the famous or infamous or otherwise unknown, depending on your standpoint, swordfish case. In fact, there were two swordfish cases. One of the WTO brought by the European Union with access to ports, the other initiated by Chile under the Law of the Sea Convention, but the, Chile, uh, the EU then responded with a counterclaim immediately um, in regard to cooperation. So we had the two swordfish cases. Um, and so far as I'm aware, this was the first occasion on which uh, Francisco was appointed uh, as an arbitrator, certainly in an unclosed case. Uh, it was also my first outing as counsel for anyone in an international dispute, but not for Chile. I was acting for the EU. Uh, well, that may or may not be why the EU's response was rather robust and aggressive. Um, but sadly for both of us, the case was um, settled without a hearing. But happily, Francisco went on to serve with distinction as a judge and arbitrator in other cases, including most obviously Peru, Chile. And I must say, it always did strike me that Francisco would have made an absolutely excellent judge of the ICJ. And he's, he's, he's one of a small number of people um, who should have been there but never got there. But the issues in the Swordfish case didn't go away. Um, and although Francisco's innovative solution was unsuccessful, it was not without impact because what followed was agreement uh, on the 1995 UN um, agreement on straddling and highly migratory fish stocks, which did quite a lot of what Canada and Chile had sought. It became the first global fisheries agreement to secure um, a broad participation from, um, from coastal and distant water fishing states, including Chile and the EU. And I think this was a model of international cooperation of which Orega Vicuña approved. Uh, in one of his best articles on Law of the Sea, I think it's actually out of the book, um, he observed how the traditional concept of high seas freedom of fishing had been substantially altered by the 1995 agreement, if indeed it could be said to have survived at all. And he concluded also that the special interests of, of the coastal state, including Chile, uh, yeah, including Chile um, had been duly recognized in uh, the agreement. Um, but he wasn't starry-eyed about the chances of the new regime succeeding. In one of his last essays on the subject, uh, this was taken from a chapter in the book that Michael ref uh, referred to, um, he concluded, and I, I quote, the end result has been the continuing over-exploitation by distant water fishing interests, detrimental not only to the high seas strictly, but also to the neighboring areas under the exclusive economic zone of coastal states. And of course, here we have precisely still exactly the same problem that he had first grappled with professionally in the swordfish case. Was he right to remain skeptical? Yes, he was, though well, with some reservations. Um, I've just 
recently been working on finishing off the fourth edition of my own book on international environmental law, and there is a chapter on fisheries on that, so let me share with you one or two of the points that I've extracted out of that to see whether he was right or not. What is true is that a great deal has changed, changed probably for the better since the days of the swordfish case in the Presenthial Sea. We've now got international agreement on a precautionary approach to protection of the marine ecosystem and biological diversity uh, in a number of agreements and in some of the case law. Uh, we've got revisions to treaties like the London Dumping Convention and the Regional Seas Agreements to, uh, with an emphasis on integrated and precautionary approaches. And all of these developments have undoubtedly reshaped the law relating to marine living resources. So it's certainly true that we now have a more conceptually sophisticated focus uh, on marine conservation uh, than we had in the early 1990s. But has this evolution done any good? Only in part. Let's take a few examples. Since 1950, the areas of ocean where there's little or no oxygen have quadrupled in size, and the Gulf of Mexico now has the largest biologically dead zone of any semi-enclosed sea caused largely by the agricultural pollutants pouring out of the Mississippi. We've not even begun to tackle the mounting evidence of plastic pollution on land in the rivers and at sea. Research, for example, has shown that more than 8 million tons of plastic are entering the oceans annually, and high concentrations of microplastics have been found in the remotest areas and in, mar and in marine living resources, including coral reefs. And if you eat fish, you're probably eating plastic. Our consumption of plastic is quite obviously unsustainable. Uh, but even without plastic fish, the state of marine living resources would still be uh, a cause for uh, concern. Um, much, uh, well, one of the most important objectives of post-unsaid fisheries law reform was to strengthen cooperation regionally. And that has happened up to a point. But if you look at some of the regional agreements, particularly the tuna ones, the Atlantic Tuna Convention, just to take one example, you can see that they are still severely dysfunctional and they're still a long way from the kind of co effective regional cooperation that Francisco would have, uh, would have endorsed. Uh, there is indeed still no regional agreement for the Southeast Pacific. And the analysis of failure of regional fisheries organizations that was given by academics in the 1970s remains as pertinent today as it did then. And I've no doubt that conclusion would have disappointed uh, Francisco, but not surprised him. We could say something similar about efforts to improve compliance by fishing vessels. Excellent advisory opinion from the Tribunal of the Law of the Sea in 2015. But if you take the South China Sea arbitration, you can see clear evidence there of a flag state that was not ensuring that its vessels complied with uh, the law of the coastal state or indeed with the convention. Um, and there are many other instances. Flag states find it very difficult to police their own fishing vessels. Um, what we do have now is something that Chile uh, and Francisco would recognize uh, which is the FAO Agreement on Port State Measures, which effectively endorses precisely the same kind of regime that Chile applied to the EU in the swordfish case, that is, uh, prohibiting access to ports and denying access to markets. Uh, so to that extent, uh, the precedent set by Chile in the Presencial Sea has now become international law. But have any of these changes made a real difference? The UN's 2015 Sustainable Development Goals commit states to end overfishing, illegal, unreported, and, unreg and unregulated fishing and destructive fishing practices, and to implement science-based management plans in order to restore fish stocks. That was 2015. That's what they said in 1992, in more or less identical language. Um, it makes you wonder whether the extensive changes and the very extensive changes in fisheries law over the intervening period since 1992 have changed anything at all. I have to say, looking at FAO's reports, you might think they haven't. 
The 2016 report of the State of the World's Fisheries confirms the point. 25% of fish stocks were overfished in 1992. By 2013, the figure was 31.4% of fish stocks were over, overfished. Uh, to put it another way, um, biologically sustainable levels of fish stocks were 90% in 1974, 68.6% in 2013. We're left with the obvious question. Um, is international law part of the problem, or is it part of the solution? Um, it's certainly difficult to conclude that further reform of international fisheries law would do any good at all. The legal regime we now have is complex. Uh, not all states are part of it, but it addresses the right things. Uh, you wouldn't set up different policy objectives, and I think um, Francisco would have agreed with the objectives of the present regime. They are uh, basically to produce a coherent um, ecosystem-based approach, taking a precautionary approach and addressing protection of the marine environment as a whole. That's obviously the right objective. But we plainly haven't succeeded in getting there. Um, even if we had, however, there is another threat coming over the horizon, one that Francisco did recognize in his, in his last writings, uh, but I will preface it by turning to say something about his writing on Antarctica, because that leads on to the obvious big problem, uh, which is climate change. Um, the Antarctic, of course, was the subject of his thesis. Uh, Antarctica has been something of a laboratory for innovative solutions to the problems that interested uh, Rega Vicuña. Um, it was the first, uh, the Antarctic Treaties were the first example uh, of an ecosystem approach to fisheries conservation. Uh, they're also even today uh, the best example um, of a comprehensive environmental impact assessment regime for a continent as a whole. Uh, Francisco's most significant contribution to Antarctic law and policy was the writing that emerged from his thesis, and the specific subject of that was the emerging legal framework for Antarctic mineral exploitation. There are, there are minerals under the ice in Antarctica. But they may even be more accessible with climate change. Um, it was perhaps his misfortune to choose that topic, because having finished his PhD and then published a book on it, the states who had negotiated the Convention for the Regulation of Antarctic Mineral Resources then changed their mind. Um, and they adopted an entirely different regime. So the convention that Francisco wrote about was stillborn, um, and we ended up instead with a protocol on environment uh, protection, which was, very, which was a very different outcome from the one that Francisco had envisaged. In his more recent writings, he drew attention to the successes and risks of the Antarctic Treaty System, uh, he thought it was one of the most successful examples of international cooperation, um, while at the same time safeguarding the rights of countries that had laid down territorial claims, of which, of course, Chile uh, was one. He did see some risks in the growing internationalization of Antarctica and the opening up of participation in the regime uh, to states that did not have significant scientific research programs there. He thought that the inevitable consequence of that would be a weakening of Antarctic scientific research. Um, he was right to conclude that there's no reason to be complacent about the future uh, of the Antarctic treaty system, but I think he was wrong to think that scientific research would be weakened. Uh, on the contrary, faced with the challenge of climate change, Antarctic science has never been more central to human concerns. Uh, Antarctic ice cores. Some of my some of my colleagues in the University of Edinburgh spend their summer vacations drilling in the Antarctic ice, and they've and they've gone down 800,000 years into the ice so far. They're hoping to get to a million years. Um, quite what you then? Uh, I'm not quite sure how deep you have to go to get to a million years of ice. Uh, it's probably rather a long. It's probably bigger than an ice lolly. Let me put it that way. But, uh, what you then do with it, I have no idea. But anyway, what they have demonstrated, having, having got down there, is the global temperatures and the carbon content of the atmosphere um, 
have never been higher in all of the time that they can measure. That Antarctica itself is melting uh, with extensive future effects on sea levels and on the marine ecosystem. And climate change does illustrate that uh, Francisco's focus on balancing international cooperation with the rights and interests of individual states was soundly based. But the problem that it also highlights is that if we pay too much regard to the claims and interests of individual states or groups of states, we may fail to address the collective problem adequately. And that has to date been the fate of all attempts to regulate and control climate change. Uh, how much longer do I have? Oh, you still have time if you wish. Well, I've got four minutes to finish That's my presentation. Oh, excellent. Right. Well, maybe five. Because if we fail to cooperate effectively on climate change, then we will also render largely irrelevant existing regimes for protecting Antarctica, the marine environment, and regional fisheries. Climate change is already generating ocean warming and acidification, melting ice caps, killing coral reefs, and forcing changes in the abundance and distribution of fish stocks. When I was a little boy, we always went on holiday in the west of Ireland. Um, there, were, there, were, there were customs posts about five miles from the border, Mr. Johnson. He's trying to take us back to the 1960s. Um, not the 1980s, that was different. There were men with guns then. Um, anyway, but after you'd gone through the customs post, got to the west of Ireland, I remember my dad buying me a, a, a fishing rod, and young Alan flings it out into a harbour that is black with mackerel. And even the 10-year-old Alan could catch mackerel basically without having any skill at all. You just reel them in. So after I'd got to 10, my mother said, stop, I'm not cooking anymore. <laughs> anyway, that was then. Today, you won't see any mackerel in the harbors of the west of Ireland. They've all emigrated north around the Faroe Islands where they give rise to fisheries disputes between Denmark and, well, between the Faroe Islands and the EU. That's because of climate change. It's too warm off the west of Ireland today for mackerel. Um, in his final writings, Francisco clearly showed that he was aware, he was acutely aware of the risks to the environment of climate change. Uh, we don't have the benefit of his views on how to address it, but I somehow think he wouldn't disagree with my conclusions, and I've got four conclusions, and that will bring me to an end. First, I, I think we can see that the obstacles to effective cooperation, at least in this context, uh, in the context of global environmental regimes are essentially political and policy oriented rather than legal. They are best seen as a reflection of the difficulties of securing international agreement on global environmental management within a complex and diffuse structure of political authority and above all the deeply conflicting policy priorities among developed and developing states. I, you only have to look at China. Which way is it pointing? You can have you spend all afternoon arguing about that one. The Chinese have more solar panels than anybody else. They also burn more coal than anybody else. Um, these are problems that cannot be solved by more law or more lawyers or more litigation. Second, what works well in one case may not work well at all in others. Uh, some of the literature takes a different view. It, tends to see effective cooperation as a function of regime design. And the underlying hypothesis is that if we learn the lessons of older regimes, we can improve the effectiveness of newer ones. Well, this may be true up to a point in certain cases. Um, but the evidence of environmental regimes suggests that the effectiveness of different regulatory and enforcement techniques is more often determined by the nature of the problem and the objectives of the agreement than by the design of its provisions or institutions. And I think this was a point that Francisco would have no difficulty recognizing whatever. A comparison of the ozone regime, which works, and the climate regime, which doesn't, makes the point. Third, the problem is not one of non-compliance. All parties have complied with the Kyoto Protocol, and even the United States has actually reduced its own greenhouse gas emissions significantly, and had it been a party, it probably would have complied despite, uh, even though it, uh, of course, as we knew, it didn't, uh, but it probably would have been in compliance. Fundamentally, we have made no progress on climate change because China and India have massively incre 
increased their greenhouse gas emissions over the 20 years since the climate regime entered into force, as they're perfectly entitled to do under the Kyoto Protocol. So this is not evidence of institutional regime failure. It's a political failure. Governments have simply failed to address the problem <coughs> adequately. And I have to say, for my money, Greta Thunberg is absolutely spot on. Uh, we could say much the same about plastic pollution in the oceans or domestic air pollution, which is now one of the world's leading public health problems. It's one of the reasons why global health expectancy, uh, life expectancy is going down rather than up. Although it is true that eating too much food is another. Fourth, uh, we are essentially, it seems to me, stuck with the institutions we currently have and proposals for new institutions simply risk deflecting attention from the underlying political failure uh, to address the core policy issue with sufficient vigor. They are, in other words, a displacement activity. There are environmentalists who argue for a radical restructuring of international governance, abandoning the present model of, majority of, um, of cooperation in favor of some majoritarian system. There are others who think that UNEP or UN Environment, as it's now called, should be turned into an international organization modeled on the WTO. But the WTO hasn't exactly been a great success as a global lawmaker. Uh, and without exceptional powers, it's difficult to see how a global environmental organization could do any better. So there is a fundamental question here that Francisco would undoubtedly have recognized. And he would have relished dealing with it. Um, if we are failing to tackle global environmental problems effectively, and the evidence shows that we are, is this because the institutions of global governance, i.e. the UN, or the UN system, or the network of autonomous regulatory regimes, multilateral environmental agreements, or the system of international courts and tribunals are too fragmented and poorly structured? I doubt it. Or is it because the global lawmakers, states, are simply unable to agree on policies that are strong enough to deliver real solutions to global environmental problems? Have we, in other words, paid far too much attention to promoting economic development since the Rio conference and not nearly enough attention to protecting the environment? Uh, you can probably guess my conclusion. Um, I do think we need to stop fooling ourselves that the world is sustainable. As for Antarctica, and the marine environment, two area, uh, the two areas of international law to which uh, my good friend and esteemed colleague Francisco Orega Vicuña devoted so much of his career, um, he would no doubt have agreed with David Attenborough. The future of the blue planet depends on us. Thank you. I thank the speakers for two enticing presentations. We have uh, five minutes if there are any questions, comments. They're very welcome now. I'll make a comment. Yes, please. It's fine. It's fine. It all works. Um, well, um, in case Alan's talk was too serious for anyone, I wanted to reply to his question, he said, what do you do with 800-year-old ice? If you go to the British Antarctic Survey, you get it in your gin and tonic. <laughs> and it doesn't actually taste any better than new ice. In fact, probably it's slightly stale. Uh, I wanted to make one uh, slightly more serious point, and that is that uh, we've had some really excellent uh, presentations here, uh, largely based on people's notes, I think. Can it might be a very good idea if, uh, if at least some of these, if people wish, could be put on a website. Uh, I believe there will be a website, and some of the things that have been said today uh, would look really good on a website, I think, without the need to do footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, we do have another question. Please.
I don't know what he would say, but I know what I would say. <laughs> uh, I think he would say this in general too, and that is uh, be a generalist before you be a specialist. That's a point other people have made. And uh, indeed, try to concentrate on some of the more general aspects of, of our topic, our subject, which still need uh, sorting out and not to do so in too theoretical a way, but to do so in as practical a way as possible. I'm rather selfish. I think writings that practitioners find useful are useful, and other writings uh, perhaps less so. Um, so. So I think that if I was going to pick a particular subject, uh, I'm afraid I would be uh, very old-fashioned and say the law and the use of force, um, of which there is a chapter in this book. This book to be. Thank you. I suppose, with the exception of that last comment, I would agree entirely with Michael, um, and I think that 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 is good advice for a young international lawyer today. Um, I think if you're if you want to be an academic, I think it's important that you avoid becoming the sort of academic who knows more and more about less and less, because if you follow that trajectory, you end up knowing everything there is to know about nothing at all, and that's probably not a good idea. Um, I, I think Francisco's transition, really, from law of the sea to international arbitration is an interesting one as well. And, and it shows how versatile good international lawyers can be. I, I, I'm sure Michael would have made an excellent investment arbitrator. Well, I am an investment arbitrator. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone had ever given them the opportunity. Uh, and, uh, so I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know whether Francisco would have done the same again if he if he'd been given the opportunity. Somebody asked me when I retired, uh, uh, would I have done the same again? And, and, I, and I said, well, actually, yes. I had a jolly interesting career, and I don't think I would choose anything else uh, today. I, obviously, I had other careers that I would have been terrible at. You know, I wanted to run the Air Force when I was a schoolboy, and I, wisely the Air Force had other ideas. But, but I think being an international lawyer has been an excellent career, and I think that's what Francisco thought, I suspect. Um, and I'm sure he would say the same to young international lawyers, young students today. Can I add one more thing? Oh, you go. i just add one more thing, and that is that I think uh, Francisco was uh, an academic and a practitioner. And I do think it's really important to try and be both. Academics who are not practitioners, no doubt are fine, but I think the combination of an academic and a practitioner is, is ideal. And it's regrettable that at some universities um, in this country there has been a tendency uh, to, to avoid appointing people who are also practitioners. Perhaps for good, well, for reasons connected with university management and uni the demands on universities, but I, I think it's a, a big mistake, particularly in the field of academic law, because of international law, because if you're taught international law by, by someone who's not got any practical experience. It seems even more theoretical and unreal and academic uh, th than it might otherwise be. And, and I think it's essential. I mean, when I was taught by Elie Lauterpacht and Clive Parry, these people all described the cases they're involved in, and that's what made it interesting. So it's very regrettable that at uh, some uh, universities, I won't name any. Uh, <laughs> Very well. I would agree with all of these comments, maybe except for the law of the force, a uh, use of force, because that might be the best proof that international does not exist. But um, <laughs> we shall leave it here, and thank you very much. Oh, you, sorry, Rosalind, please. Can I uh, send you off with a relaxed comment to your company, which stems from the fact that you were a moderator. social gathering uh, to which Professor Andre Nolkamper, who I've never met before from Amsterdam, was present. And as the evening went on and, and wishing to be friendly, I said, well, I think I can safely leave formalities behind and I can now uh, say, dear Nol. <laughs> 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 very well.
Very well. With this, we will conclude this panel, a short coffee break, and we will continue with the next panel in 15 minutes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Nothing is impossible. Just you don't have to read it. The length it makes scares people away. But once they wrap up with it, then they are they're good. Hey, well, thank you so much. You. It was entertaining okay. and uh, I think very well. Well, good time. Yeah, you said I should do 25 minutes, so I had to produce a serious talk. No, you did. You were very serious. <laughs> it was very wow. serious, and I really liked it. It was excellent. No one yeah. else has been serious. Thank <laughs> you. We jolly, were jolly lucky that I did my We had a discussion.
the night of the Father. Also, we have notes. Huh? I always have notes. I wrote it. Yeah. Because it's. I normally don't, but in the things I, like I that. I normally do, I cannot improve in my profile. I don't like. And I, even if you improvise, it's much better if you have a written it before. Can you memorize it? secuestro y porque no puedo ser, no, no sé qué va a hacer laudos, ya y, no sé, es una cuestión también, pero yo no, no me, me hice un sitio para estar solo con eso y concentrarme, si no soy, soy incapaz. Dear Dear Orego family, Mr. Ambassador of Chile, dear colleagues and friends, we are here today because of our collective desire to fulfill the need to celebrate the life and the legacy of Professor Orrego Vicuña, or Francisco, or Cato, as, we used to be, as he used to be called by some of us. Many of us were unable to bid him farewell properly at the time of his passing a year ago, and we are most grateful to the Chilean Embassy in London, the Department of Law at LSE, and the Heidelberg Center for Latin America for giving us this opportunity today. As some speakers and moderators mentioned earlier, Professor Orego Vicuña has left his mark in almost all areas of international law. He was equally at ease in public international law, including the delimitation of land and maritime boundaries, investment law, commercial law, 
trade law, environmental law, and international administrative law. He was an international academic, a professor of law in Chile, and a visiting professor of law in Paris and the United States. In addition to being the president of the World Bank Administrative Tribunal, he was a judge at the International Monetary Fund Administrative Tribunal, a judge ad hoc at the International Court of Justice and at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, and he chaired a panel of commissioners at the United Nations Compensation Commission. He was also a leading international arbitrator, having acted as tribunal chair or co-arbitrator in dozens of international arbitration proceedings under a wide range of rules, as well as a former vice president of the London Court of International Arbitration, LCIA, and a former member of the governing board of the International Council for Commercial Arbitration, ICA. It is on this very last aspect of Professor Orego Vicuña's exceedingly rich career, namely international arbitration in the fields of commerce and investment, that this panel will focus its attention. The name of Professor Orego will be associated for a long time with a decision rendered in January 2000 by a tribunal he was chairing in a case brought by an Argentinian national, Mr. Maffezzini, against Spain on the basis of the Argentina-Spain Bilateral Investment Treaty. There, the tribunal found that the most favored nation, MFN clause, contained in the Argentina-Spain BIT, entitled Mr. Maffezzini to rely on the more favorable arrangements concerning dispute resolution contained in the Chile-Spain BIT. Five years later, in February 2005, in the Plama versus Bulgaria case, the tribunal departed from the reasoning of the tribunal in Maffezzini versus Spain. The Plama tribunal disagreed with the, with the assertion by the Maffezzini tribunal that the harmonization of dispute settlement provisions could be achieved by reliance on the MFN clause. To navigate us all through the Maffezzini decision and its implications, and the relationship between the Argentina-Spain BIT and the Chile-Spain <coughs> BIT. Who is better placed than Professor Orego's Spanish friend and the friend of many of us here today, Professor Juan Fernandez Armesto? Juan is a leading international arbitrator in his own right, a vice president of the governing board of ICA, a former president of the Spanish Securities and Exchange Commission, and a partner at Armesto and Asociados in Madrid. I leave the floor to Juan. Thank you, Nasib. You have not said the only negative factor in my career, and it's especially negative in this room. I am the only one here who comes from private law. I know nothing about international law. I am overawed eh, and, uh, in respect for international law which to me is a dark uh, box. But uh, this, yesterday and today, have been cathartic, uh, because I have now learned that I am not the only one who thinks that the international law does not exist, <laughs> that a member of the Orrego family holds exactly the same position, and uh, that my hero in the world of international law, Professor Orrego Vicuña, he didn't totally disagree. <laughs> um, the most famous elegy of uh, a dead person was written 500 years ago in Spanish. And that was Jorge Manrique. I am sure that in Chile and in Spain, we share this famous stanza. Uh, Nuestras vidas son los ríos que van a dar a la mar, que es el morir. Allí van los señoríos derechos as a consumir. But we are in England, and there is a beautiful translation by a Longfellow into English, which I will now quote for our English friends. Our lives are rivers gliding free to that unfathomed, boundless sea, the silent grave. Thither all earthly pomp and boast roll to be swallowed up and lost in one dark wave. 
So it's uh, one of these stanzas which you can say either in Spanish or in English, and I think it perfectly uh, reflects uh, what we are doing here. We are doing here is um, preserving the third life of uh, Professor Rego Vicuña. The way Jorge Manrica was preserving the third life of his father, Don Rodrigo. Uh, the first, uh, this is a very Renaissance thought, uh, that you have three lives, not one life. And uh, it's, of course, a, a, a thought which uh, um, gives us more uh, enthusiasm uh, towards the future. The first life, of course, is this earthly life, uh, which we all know, Certus an in certus quando, we will join uh, Cato in uh, death. But then there is, hopefully, a second life, the life of transcendence. Um, there we did yesterday what we can. We prayed for uh, Cato, we prayed for his eternal life. We have no knowledge. This is a, there is a barrier in the knowledge um, of uh, what will happen to our transcendence. Um, I'm sure that Cato had faith, and faith is the only thing which really helps for the second life. I'm sure that he had a complete faith uh, that there would be uh, a continuation and that we will all meet again in a, an eternal life um, sometime and somehow. And then there is this third life. Uh, and we are here not to discuss the second or the first life, but the third life. Um, and the third life is the life of fame, the, the life of being remembered. Uh? And uh, I am, will now focus on um, why and how um, Francisco Rego Vicuña will be remembered in the world of investment arbitration, which I think that in his last 20 years, uh, I, was, I don't know if it was the main facet, but it was certainly one of the main facets of his life. And before I go on, I must make a disclaimer that is I have a closer friendship with Orrego Vicuña than any one of you around here. Because you may be bonded to Cato through international law, through uh, academia, but I was bonded to him through something much more intense, which is uh, our love for breeding cows. Uh, and you know that uh, Francisco, one of the most, he owned a beautiful farm on the seashore in, um, in uh, Chile. He bred beautiful cows. I do also breed, breed some very nice cows, not quite as beautiful the place as uh, in Chile. And so we gossiped something which none of you ha have been able to do. We gossiped and spoke about agriculture, cows, bulls, horses, uh, dogs, and this type of um, uh, things. So that really creates uh, an intimate bond. Um, as an arbitrator, Francisco Orrego wrote many awards. Um, which have become leading cases, but uh, um, uh, Nassif has already said it, Maffezzini versus Spain stands out. And this is not my own opinion. It is the opinion of the arbitration community. In 2009, the IBA, the International Bar Association, held an annual conference in Madrid. They asked me to organize the panel on investment arbitration. And I thought, why don't we organize a ballot uh, among all the members of the IBA, so it's all the lawyers specialized in international law, to establish by public uh, acclaim the five most decisive cases in the history of investment arbitration. And which case won? Maffezzini against Spain, and by a rather uh, a big margin. So this is the case which chaired, uh, was chaired by Cato with two very distinguished uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Judge uh, Bergenthal and uh, Maurice Wolf. So it's a highly, highly competent uh, panel. Uh, by the way, uh, in the, among the five leading cases, there was another one, which was uh, by uh, Orrego Vicuña, which is CMS against Argentina. And this just proves that in the first decade of investment arbitration, investment arbitration existed from the beginning of the century onwards, uh, 
when investment arbitration was being formed and became what we now know it is, um, uh, the opinion and the decisions of Orego Vicuña have been decisive. If we had not had Orego Vicuña, we might have a completely different investment arbitration. This expensive force of investment arbitration, this idea of his that individuals must have the possibility of getting protection under uh, international law. That international law is not only the International Court of Justice, some states, um, some principles, but no, no flesh. Eh? He was able to realize that by setting the first decisive cases in investment arbitration. And none of them is more uh, significant than Maffezzini. Now, Maffezzini is an ideal case, huh? because Maffezzini was an Argentinian, huh? and he had invested in an OECD country in Spain. Huh? By the way, he had invested in my region, in Galicia. And he had decided to have a joint venture with a state uh, um, promotion agency uh, to build some uh, chemistry factories, uh, something not very pleasant for the environment. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, you cannot be too choosy with foreign investment. Anyway, it's, um, it was a total fiasco. Huh? Uh, and the government and Mr. Maffezzini uh, threw at each other the, 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 to be the cause of the fiasco. and. The plant was never built, and Mr. Maffezzini lost all his money, and I must say some Spanish government money was also lost in the process. And the amazing thing is that Mr. Maffezzini, eh, who had this problem in a remote province uh, in Spain with a remote uh, government agency for um, regional promotion, and I must mention his lawyer, it was uh, Vinuesa, it was Dr. Vinuesa. Uh, Dr. Vinuesa is one of these lawyers who made history. He decided not to go to the regional court in Galicia, but to sue the Kingdom of Spain uh, at Ixid in Washington. To the, amaze, to the total surprise of Spain and of the Spanish Ministry of Justice, which had never, ever heard about investment arbitration. Anyway. And, they had never. It was 2000, in 1999. No one had ever heard. Spain had signed these treaties, but it had been signed, sorry, Ambassador, it had been signed by diplomats. And they thought, <laughs> they thought it was just, uh, they thought it was just, you know, uh, do, um, some papers, which when uh, heads of state come, you put them to the heads of state or to the ministers, and they sign and photographs. But no one had given thought to the idea that it could really imply that an Argentinian could sue the Kingdom of Spain. <laughs> and um, so uh, then it's, uh, it was the, the other good thing is it was a very small case. I mean, it was small money. It was a couple of hundred thousand um, dollars. And if you, we compare it now with the cases now, it's uh, so it, it is an ideal case to establish precedent. And, President, he did establish. I mean, there is no doubt eh, that when he make, went through the various decisions of Maffezzini, Cato wanted to establish president because he says much more than was really necessary to solve the case. Eh? So, for example, um, the first case, eh, Spain said, "Look here, Maffezzini is a poor Argentinian guy. Uh, he has no money." He's suing us. He should put up a bond. Huh? And um, yeah, uh, because yeah, Argentina suing Spain. Uh, so that was the reaction of the Spanish state. And um, the decision of the tribunal was, no, it rejected the Spanish request. But then it went on to establish a president, uh, which is comp was completely unnecessary to establish it. And I'm sure that Francisco wanted to establish the president. Namely, he said, we are not making now um, a provisional measure. We could have made a provisional measure. And the next thing he said is, uh, although the exit convention says uh, tribunals can recommend provisional measures, in international law, uh, there, is, there is this magic of, uh, that you can change the words. And recommend in an international law means something different to what it would have meant to private lawyers, it meant order. So he established the president that 
Although the treaty says recommend, tribunals can order provisional measures against governments, um, which have come extremely handy. I mean, we have all, you have, you have seen it quoted, and I have quoted it hundreds of times. Every time when you want to say, this is a professional measure and you state must comply with it, uh, then uh, Maffezzini comes very handy. <laughs> the second problem of Mr. Maffezzini was that Mr. Maffezzini uh, had not complied with the treaty. Uh, Argentina had a very uh, interesting provision that before you could start arbitration, you had to go for 18 months to a local court in Argentina and present the case. And if after 18 months, you could then start the arbitration. And Mr. Maffezzini had not done that at all. Uh, he had not gone to a Spanish court. He had not started an action. He just went straight to Washington. So any normal lawyer would have said, Mr. Maffezzini, you have a lost cause. Uh, but then came this most favored nation clause. There was a most favored nation clause in the treaty which says that, said that all the matters subject to this agreement, if there is another treaty which is more favorable, it can be invoked. And Mr. Maffezzini invoked a Chilean treaty, by the way, eh? this treaty between Spain and Chile, which did not have the 18-month requirement. And, and this is, of course, also the president, and you have told us, the tribunal accepted to extend a jurisdiction um, to extend uh, the, the Treaty of Chile mm, to the, uh, an Argentinian investor on the basis of the most favored nation clause and to accept uh, jurisdiction. Um, that said, I mean, this is the most contentious part of Maffezzini. Uh, some people have agreed, uh, some cases have agreed, others have not agreed. Um, I have heard Professor Orrego Vicuña himself uh, construe and explain Maffezzini. And he also, he was a very measured person. And he always uh, explained that Maffezzini was a special case that you needed first uh, um, a, a, a most favored nation clause, which was very widely uh, drafted, first point. And uh, that through the most favored nation clause, you could never override significant public policy considerations which the states considered fundamental. But he said that Spain, and in that he was quite right, Spain had never thought that the 18-month requirement was a significant policy issue for Spain. In fact, Spain never used it in any other of the treaties. So Maffezzini uh, has been applied in most of the, and Gabriel knows that much better than me, but it has been applied in most of the cases against Argentina, has been accepted by tribunals. It has not been accepted when then claimants tried to do, uh, to, to pick a completely different clause from another treaty and insert it into one treaty. And in those cases, Maffezzini was rejected. Or the, and I think that Francisco Rego Vicuña would have agreed, uh, that he agreed that you cannot make an ex extensive reading of Maffezzini. There is a third point which is really important, and that is uh, uh, Spain raised a further objection. Um, the, the Sodiga, which was the uh, regional Galician uh, uh, agency, was a private company, was a corporation, a Sociedad Anonima, and the state was only a shareholder, a majority shareholder, but only a shareholder of that company. And um, Spain, not with some force, said, how can the kingdom be responsible for a company in which it only is a shareholder in a remote uh, region? And Maffezzini then established the test um, to, for state-owned companies to uh, be imputed to the state. And this is still the test. I mean, this is really the part of Maffezzini has survived uh, all uh, uh, discussions. It's still the test we all apply. Uh, that first, um, there must be a, a structural requirement uh, uh, that the state must have the majority of the shares. And that is simply a refutable presumption. And then a functional test that the entity performs governmental functions. Anyway. Then finally, uh, when we then, 
after all these jurisdictional problems, uh, eventually, uh, uh, Maffezzini came, uh, the tribunal came to the merits. Uh, and what did it decide? Uh, well, uh, in, in, in most of the claims of Mr. Maffezzini were rejected. There was one claim which survived. Uh, and uh, which survived and were, uh, I think it's one of the very first or the first case where a tribunal finds that the fair and equitable treatment standard had not been complied with. And uh, that was, it's, it's also a funny claim. Um, Mr. Maffezzini um, had deposited some money at a bank uh, and had given a power of attorney to uh, an employee of this government agency that if things went poorly, uh, he could then, the agency could then use his money and inject it into the company. And th it was a really informal arrangement, not really very properly formalized. And the tribunal found that it had been, uh, it had not been properly formalized and that there was a breach of the fair and equitable treatment. One notices that at the end there is a certain element of sympathy eh, towards Mr. Maffetini. Eh? He had lost everything. He had. Uh, uh, on, on, on the basic claims, he was not successful. Yeah, you understand me. Um, so with this, I come uh, to the end. Um, Jorge Manrique was very successful with his elegy. Um, he extended the third life of his father, of Don Rodrigo, who died 1460, and we still all remember Don Rodrigo. Uh, we, he extended his third life by 600 years. So I will not be presumptuous. Uh, I do not think that Maffezzini will preserve the third life of Francisco Rego Vicuña for half a millennium. No. Um, I'm sure there will be no investment arbitration in half a millennium. Uh, um, but I am sure that at least for the next decades, uh, the decision in Maffezzini will preserve the name and the reputation, the third life of Francisco Orrego Vicuña. Thank you, Juan. In the wake of the Maffezini decision, which was viewed in some quarters as mainly favoring the interests of investors, some regarded Professor Orrego Vicuña as being receptive to the investors' concerns above all. These views were, however, superficial, as they failed to consider Professor Origo Vicuña's overall record in the field of investment arbitration. A careful look at his record will show not only that he was a member of many arbitration tribunals that rendered awards in favor of respondent states, but also that there is one award that can be found in the public record, Siag versus Arab Republic of Egypt, in which he even departed from the tribunal majority and rendered a dissenting opinion in favor of the respondent state. Let me address briefly this decision. In 2005, Mr. Wagih Siag and his mother filed a request for arbitration at ICSID against Egypt on the basis of the Egypt-Italy BIT, which was concluded in 1989. Mr. Siag was an Egyptian national from birth. In December 1989, he submitted an application to the Egyptian Minister of Interior for permission to acquire Lebanese nationality pursuant to Egypt's nationality law. In December 1990, the Egyptian Minister of Interior issued a decree acknowledging Mr. Siag's prior acquisition of Lebanese nationality and granting him permission to maintain his Egyptian nationality. Mr. Siag acquired Italian nationality in 1993 on the basis of his marriage to an Italian citizen. Apart from the tribunal's division on the interpretation of Egypt's nationality law, its members disagreed on the application of the exit convention and of the principles of international law governing the matter. Article 25.1 of the exit convention provides that exit jurisdiction extends to any legal dispute arising directly out of an investment between a contracting state and a national of another contracting state. The tribunal's majority, as well as Professor Orrego in his dissent noted, 
that Article 25.2a of the Exit Convention contains a negative nationality requirement, according to which a national of another contracting state does not include, as far as jurisdiction is concerned, any person who has the nationality of the respondent state on two dates. The date on which the parties consented to submit such dispute to conciliation or arbitration, and the date of registration of the arbitration request. Professor Orego stressed that the drafting history of Article 25.2a of the Exit Convention reveals that many countries insisted their nationals should not be able to bring international arbitration proceedings against them despite being nationals of another contracting state too. The report of the executive directors of the World Bank that accompanied the Exit Convention stated that this ineligibility is absolute and cannot be cured even if the state part to the dispute had given its consent. Professor Orego opined that the prohibition was a kind of rule of huscogens of from which there would, could be no derogation by consent. The tribunal's majority held that the regime established under Article 25 of the Exit Convention does not leave room for a test of dominant and effective nationality, that through the operation of the Egyptian nationality law, both claimants had lost their Egyptian nationality and held only Italian nationality at the relevant dates for the purposes of the Exit Convention, and that under the Exit Convention, these dates are the date of consent and the date of registration. In his dissent, Professor Orego observed that in the case of a bilateral investment treaty, the date of the state's expression of consent is the date of entry into force of the treaty, and that the investor expresses its consent later in either a separate instrument or by filing its arbitration request with ICSID. As a consequence, an investor seeking to initiate ICSID proceedings must not have been a national of the host state on any of the following dates. The date of expression of consent by the host state, the date of the investor's own expression of consent, and the date of registration of its arbitration request. Professor Orego noted that as the Exit Convention does not define nationality, the principles of international law governing this matter, including the principle of effectiveness that had been accepted since the Nottebohm case, would come into play. Because of the effectiveness of the connections Mr. Siag had with Egypt at all relevant times, he was not a rightful claimant as far as jurisdiction was concerned. Professor Orego added that the principle of effectiveness meant that the nationality that was more convenient to Mr. Siak could not prevail over the real and effective nationality. Professor Orego observed that the investment was made by an Egyptian national who claimed at all relevant times to be Egyptian and who effectively maintained all his links with Egypt. Such Egyptian national then claims to have lost his Egyptian nationality by becoming Lebanese. However, he did not bring his claim under the existing BIT between Egypt and Lebanon, but under a BIT between Egypt and Italy, a country with which he had, a, at best, remote connections. Professor Orego concluded that neither international law nor the Exit Convention could have possibly intended this. Our next speaker is Dr. Gabriel Bottini. Dr. Bottini is presently a partner in the Madrid office of Oria Menendez. He was for many years the first national director of international affairs and disputes of the Treasury Attorney General's Office of Argentina. He will be discussing the CMS versus the Argentina case and its impact on the evolution of the law on sharehold treaty claims. Gabriel. Thank you, uh, Nassib. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank the Chilean Embassy, the LSE, and the Heidelberg Center for, for the invitation to commemorate uh, the life and the work of Francisco Reu Cunha. For me, it's, it's a real honor to be here with you. Um, and I found very interesting the way in which uh, Juan uh, discussed uh, the Maffesini case because I see, uh, first of all, both uh, now I know that both Maffesini and CMS were among the, the five most influential um, awards in international investment law, which, which I didn't know. Uh, I knew only about Maffesini, so that's an outstanding record for, for Francisco. Uh, but also because uh, I see, although Maffesini and CMS, as I will discuss in a moment, uh, refer to different issues um, in international law, I think there is a common thread 
that really, I think, uh, defines um, uh, Francisco, uh, at least in, in this field. And uh, to me, at least, um, Francisco was, above all, an internationalist and a strong believer in uh, the uh, right of access to an international jurisdiction. And I think that's something to celebrate. Because at least for those of us who believe that international law does exist, uh, it, it does remain uh, the last, uh, the ultimate guarantee of certain important rights of, of the individuals. So uh, I think um, this idea of Francisco of guaranteeing this right of access is, is very, very important. And um, I believe the CMS case uh, illustrates very well uh, this idea. And uh, as, as Juan said, I think that this, this is perhaps something, something that one would say in an event like this, but I, I do believe Francisco Reo Vicuña was one of the most influential um, practitioners and academics in, in, in investment law. There's no doubt about that. I think there might be maybe two or three other people that have um, you know, uh, had the same degree of influence, but not more. And the CMS case, uh, again, um, I, will I will refer briefly to the decision on jurisdiction. This is 2003, and this is the moment in which, again, as uh, Juan said, international invest investment law is being formed. There's really nothing out there. It, there's a new law that is being formed. And um, the CMS concerned, there was a sh it was a shareholder in an Argentine company, uh, this company was T TGN. Uh, TGN was in the business of gas transportation. And, uh, of course, Argentina, in the midst of its crisis, had adopted certain measures that uh, regulated the rights of this local company. CMS, as a shareholder, brings a claim. And um, Argentina says, hold on, uh, I have a, a jurisdictional objection. Uh, you are bringing a claim for... Uh, that um, relates to the rights not of the shareholder but of the local company, and you, you have no new standing to bring this claim. Um, and before that, there had been some cases, but very few discussing the rights of shareholders, but it, it was not clear to what extent shareholders could bring claims uh, in respect of measures affecting the local companies. And you have to bear in mind that, uh, of course, we had the Barcelona Attraction case, uh, which, although Juan says he doesn't know about international law, he knows a lot about, about that case, and particularly about the behind the scenes of that case, which is the most interesting part. But, um, so we had that case in which the International Court of Justice had said uh, in the 1970s that um, the state of the nationality of the, invest of the shareholder could not bring a case, a claim for um, measures uh, taken against a local company. So in that background, uh, Argentina raises this objection. And what did the tribunal say about this? First of all, the tribunal said that the, in terms of jurisdiction, the only uh, relevant provisions were those of the treaty and of international law, and that national law was really not relevant for purposes of jurisdiction. He only referred in passing to the law in Argentina about the piercing of the veil, but otherwise he said, for jurisdictional purposes, what's relevant is international law and the provisions of the treaty. As to Barcelona attraction, he said, well, that case concerned diplomatic protection, and it's not relevant in this context because we're in the context of an investment treaty, and thus diplomatic protection, the, the, the law of diplomatic, diplomatic protection is, is, less, is less relevant. Uh, Francisco was also, uh, again, um, given his emphasis on the importance of um, guaranteeing the, the access of people, of individuals, to international jurisdictions, he was uh, suspicious of what sometimes uh, is called the Vatelian fiction, right? About the idea that in diplomatic protection, it is the right of the state that is at stake. For him, it was really when someone is affected by a measure by a state, and if there is a case of diplomatic protection, if the state is protecting its own national, it's really the right, the interests of the individual that is in question, and not the right of the state. He saw this really as a fiction. 
always concerned with the real interests at stake rather than with formalities. And he asserted a couple of very important principles. First of all, he asserted the direct right of individuals to um, access to, to international law. And he also said that despite Barcelona attraction, there was no bar in international law for the direct action of shareholders to bring claims against the host state. This was the, the fundamental uh, holding of the case, right? The direct uh, right of action of shareholders against host states. And this was very important because it allowed shareholders to have a direct access to international tribunals despite the fact that shareholders would generally not be parties to the contracts uh, and probably they would ha wouldn't have been directly uh, influenced or affected by the host state measures. The host state measures would, would and typically do affect the local companies, but he said shareholders who are the real investors, who are the real interest behind the investment, do have a direct right of action. Um, recall that in Barcelona Attraction, the court had said that shareholders had a direct right of action. So the court had recognized this right, but he said it's only when a right of a shareholder is, has been affected that the shareholder can claim. Of course, in the middle, after Barcelona Attraction, we had this, you know, thousands of BITs that we have nowadays granting direct rights to, um, to shareholders and investors, and thus the landscape had changed when Francisco was deciding CMS in 2003. So basically he concluded that because these BITs give direct rights to shareholders, because they have protected investments, again, they have a direct right of action before international tribunals. Interestingly, uh, a couple of years later, in 2007, a decision from the ICJ came out in the Diallo case, in which the court, it was not clear what was the position after almost 40 years uh, after the Barcelona Traction decision, so what the court would say about the principles on, on shareholder protection. However, the court in Diallo, 2007, went back to Barcelona Traction, and with some refinements, again reaffirmed that the, the idea that um, uh, of a separate corporate personality and that we should uh, separate the rights of shareholders and the rights of a company. So they went and reaffirmed what had been said in Barcelona Traction. Mm, however, I must say that um, the principles set out in, in CMS uh, which stood even the Diallo um, case, although in Diallo the ICJ said uh, you have to take into account that when we're talking about investment treaties, that's uh, uh, lex specialis. And <coughs> perhaps different from uh, Maffesini on the issue of, of MFN, which has become uh, controversial, the issue of shareholder standing, of independent right of action of shareholders, is to nowadays virtually unanimously accepted. So this is a principle that I think Orego established in CMS and as, again, is, is nowadays unanimously accepted. Um, one uh, or two uh, final thoughts are that in uh, a later decision in 2008 in the Societe Generale v. Dominican Republic case, which is a very interesting case, which was presided by Francisco too, I think he refined his views on, on diplomatic protection and he said that uh, although investment law and investment arbitration is a specific field with its own rules, that doesn't mean that all the law of diplomatic protection and international claims is necessarily displaced. He said, well, if there is a specific rule in the treaty, then yes, you apply the specific rule, but otherwise, diplomatic protection law and the law of international claims remains relevant when you don't have a specific rule in, in the investment treaty. And I agree with that view uh, in that respect, so I think that's an important refinement. Uh, let, me, let me conclude by saying that, um, again, I think it's very important this uh, facet of, of Orego Vicuñas, of Francisco's thinking, 
and work on affirming the right of action and the right of access to international jurisdictions by shareholders, by individuals. And I think to continue his legacy, we have to start and continue reflecting on how this uh, independent right of action of shareholders coexists with causes of action by the company and by other stakeholders. We have to continue reflecting on how this independent right of action by shareholders coexists uh, with other notions in national law. And again, uh, in the end, reflect how all this might affect other stakeholders in order to uh, arrive at a, a just solution, which I think is a consideration that uh, Francisco always had in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabriel. Our next speaker is Jose Ricardo Ferris, who is a partner at Squire Patton Boggs. He served previously as Deputy Secretary General of the ICC International Court of Arbitration. He will address Professor Orego's contribution to international commercial arbitration. Thank you, Nasib. And I would like to thank uh, the organizers, Alex Jan Paz Agustin and uh, the Embassy of Chile and the Orego uh, family for uh, having me here. It's very humbling, it's a very humbling experience uh, to have been invited uh, to speak here today to remember uh, one of the greatest jurists uh, definitely of my time. Uh, I met Francisco Orego Vicuña in The Hague while I was working for another man called Francisco, uh, Francisco Resec. Uh, a Brazilian who happened to be the man who outbid uh, Orrego Vicuña in his candidacy for becoming a judge at the International Court of Justice. Um, albeit in an ad hoc capacity, uh, Francisco eventually managed to serve at the court, a role for which I think we can all agree he was born uh, to play. But in many lunches and conversations that followed our first meeting, uh, he always remembered with a lot of grace, humor, and good sport spirit how, that bidding, how in that bidding process, Chile was convinced that they had managed to obtain the, the support uh, for his candidacy. But then they failed to count on Resec's joker card. Resec happened to be uh, a Brazilian born out of two Lebanese parents. And uh, his Lebanese roots allowed him to lobby and obtain votes from Middle Eastern and Arab countries, uh, which were the votes that made the difference in the end. Um, after that story, gossiping about the ICJ became one of our favorite topics of conversation <laughs> in the years that followed uh, our first encounter. Uh, we stayed in touch, of course, when I left The Hague and, and went to, the, to Paris to work uh, at the ICC. Uh, and I was fortunate to share many meals and conversations with him uh, as well uh, in Paris, as well in many other uh, parts of the world. Um, uh, there was one, uh, there, there was one uh, time in particular that I cherish uh, very much, and I was speaking with some of the members of the Orego family during the lunch break. I was in Santiago de Chile for a conference and I was uh, ashed out. I couldn't come back to Paris because there was a volcano in Iceland uh, that sent a lot of ashes in the air. So I had to stay in Santiago de Chile for about a week. Uh, so he invited me to come with him and his family to Valparaíso uh, on a Sunday day, beautiful Sunday day. Uh, there was a parade of training ships uh, Buques Escuela, as we call them in, in Spanish. Um, uh, they were there in, in Valparaíso. And I thought it was more like a touristic trip that we were going to, uh, to, to do. Um, and when we arrived at the Esmeralda, which was the Chilean ship, uh, I noticed that uh, we were not just common tourists. Uh, the doors opened, the red uh, carpets rolled. <laughs> and we were received with open arms by the captain himself. And we were taken to a small, well, to the captain's room uh, for a, a small gathering uh, and a small uh, change of experiences and gifts. Um, 
Don Francisco offered the captain his treatise on the emergent legal framework of Antarctic mineral exploration, of course. Um, and the captain, in turn, offered him a book about the history of Esmeralda. But what was very particularly uh, about that book, I remember, was a page of the book where there was a picture of a young boy standing in the deck of the Esmeralda while it was moored in Egypt. And that boy was uh, Francisco Rego Vicuña himself uh, when he was living in Egypt, when his father was a diplomat uh, in that country. And I thought the gesture was extremely touching, but I also truly understood in that moment uh, of the grandeur of Francisco Rego Vicuña and how uh, he was linked to his country's history. It was a very, very touching moment. Now, uh, Francisco Rego Vicuña was mainly known for his work uh, in the field of public international law. We have spent the whole day speaking about that already. And Juan just said that uh, Juan was a man of the private law uh, that actually met Francisco in, in the public international law world. With me, it was a little bit the other way around. I met him in my public international law uh, times, and I, I actually got to work with him in a more of a private law capacity when I was at the ICC and I uh, managed to administer uh, many cases in which he was sitting as an arbitrator, and these cases were mainly uh, of a commercial nature, uh, uh, commercial uh, arbitrations. So I thought it was appropriate to focus my reflections uh, today in that uh, part, because there's also some contribution uh, to the field of international commercial arbitration coming out of uh, Francisco Rego Vicuña. Uh, it has been said already that he was a true uh, internationalist. He believed in the, existen in the existence of an autonomous system of alternative dispute resolution uh, for international disputes, and he said as much uh, in his book, uh, which is called International Dispute Settlement, an evolving global society, constitutionalization, accessibility, and privatization. Uh, and I'm going to take some of, the, uh, some of the lessons that we can learn from reading his book. And it is important to note that this was the product of his uh, Sir Lauder Park le lectures that he gave in 2001. So it's interesting to see that the things he was saying already or thinking about in 2001 uh, became very uh, important in the years to come for the field of international arbitration. Um, he said that that system of international dispute resolution was one of the central features of the international uh, society, and he made a difference between uh, alternative dispute resolution in the domestic context from the international context. Uh, he said that uh, in the, international country, in the international context, the system had not emerged as a result of dissatisfaction with the role of ordinary courts, as it was the case with domestic dispute resolution, uh, but that it was developed due to the need to safeguard freedom of choice. And uh, it was due also to the broad availability of alternatives for settling disputes between states and other parties. And um, the belief of such existence of such a, a system not only influenced uh, influence his work in the field of public international law, but as I said, also in the work uh, of international commercial arbitration. And um, he was a truly believer in that sense of the existence of a Lex Mercatoria, which not many uh, practitioners in the field. We said some people do not believe in, public, in international law, while some public do not believe in Lex Mercatoria either. Uh, but he did believe, and I want to share with you um, uh, an award. Uh, unfortunately, in commercial arbitration cases, the awards are not necessarily available. Uh, so I am able to relate some of the stories of the things that I saw while I was at the ICC. Uh, this was an arbitration related to the sale, purchase, and distribution of electricity between companies from two neighboring European countries. Um, so while the dispute was commercial in nature, uh, there was uh, public interest was very much at stake in the case. And so we thought that Francisco was uh, the perfect fit uh, uh, to chair that tribunal. The first issue uh, that had to be decided uh, was the applicable law. 
and the parties agreed to bifurcate uh, uh, the proceedings only to discuss about uh, the uh, law that should be applied by the arbitral tribunal. And I still remember discussing with him uh, the conclusions at which he and his colleagues arrived and the award that he wrote in that sense. Um, first, uh, they pointed out that the lack of a choice of law provision in a contract between sophisticated parties in such a sophisticated transaction and such a sophisticated field was not an actual lack of choice, but was actually a choice not to express a choice uh, to agree on the national law of any of the parties. The parties spent a lot of time briefing the tribunal as to why it was the national law of their own country that should apply. And they said, well, you clearly did not agree on any of those laws, uh, otherwise it would have been uh, included in the contract. And I thought that was a very interesting uh, conclusion. And uh, he then decided uh, to apply the common legal provisions of the two national laws that were being discussed, together with the UNIDRA principles as a reflection of Lex Mercatoria. And that, of course, when that award came for scrutiny at the ICC, it created a lot of buzz. Of course, a lot of the deniers of the existence of Lex Mercatoria thought it was outrageous. How can we say that the UNIDRA principles are the reflection of Lex Mercatoria? But that's what he believed in and that's what he uh, decided. Of course, that was an issue of substance. And so it went and the dispute uh, was then very well conducted and reached a very satisfactory uh, result for the parties uh, in the end. Um, that said, Francisco Rego uh, was not a fanatic. Uh, he well acknowledged that the system uh, had its own limitations. And as in any other system, it was in need of improvement uh, and evolution. And in those lotter pack series, uh, he identified various areas for evolution and improvement. And let's remember again, this was 2001, and I will focus on a couple of them uh, in the interest of time. The first of them uh, was his conviction that contemporary dispute resolution needed to ensure prevention rather than resolution of disputes. Uh, he thought that the uh, emphasis on prevention was relevant with respect to both political and legal disputes. He was convinced that the emphasis on prevention in the legal environment would result in new pressures on enlarging the availability of dispute resolution options. And he was, of course, uh, right. Uh, in fact, one of sub such options that he identified in the lectures and that he believed uh, very much in was what he called flexible mediation. And he did make reference to the papal mediation between Chile and Argentina, which has been discussed uh, today already. Um, and uh, he said that he expected uh, mediation to be subject to further institutionalization. And I suggest that that's exactly what we have witnessed this year with the signature and entry into force of the Singapore Convention on Mediation. Uh, I'm sure that the work that he did on that field was definitely uh, influential in the results that we have seen uh, these days uh, with mediation taking the importance uh, that it has taken with the signature of the Singapore Convention. Uh, secondly, uh, he believed that when preventive efforts failed, uh, as sometimes uh, they did, international arbitration was the most notable development of dispute settlement in the past century and that international arbitration would continue to play uh, uh, such a role. Um, now, of course, uh, he also believed that international arbitration had to surmount uh, often legal and practical difficulties. And again, I will mention a few of them uh, that he identified uh, in the Lauder Pack lectures. Uh, the first one is uh, he believed very much, again, this was 2001, uh, in the institutionalization of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. And those uh, of us who will remember where the PCA was in 2001, it had very little relevance in the world of international uh, arbitration. <clears throat> and while the man who 
probably made that change uh, with uh, Brooks Daly, who is in the audience. Uh, uh, it's interesting to see that uh, Orrego Vicuña had already in 2001 the vision uh, to revive the PCA and gave it a more prominent role uh, in the system of international arbitration. And, and so it happened. Uh, if we look at the statistical report of 2007, uh, the PCA registered 160 cases plus 47 cases where uh, it acted as appointed authority. That's more than 200 cases, a record uh, for any international arbitration institution, and that is uh, pretty remarkable. And also the PCA has reached uh, host agreements with 12 different countries, including Chile, and that's one of the things that he identified in his lectures, that the PCA had to work with jurisdictions to help them when those jurisdictions uh, did not have all the tools and resources to actually uh, uh, play an important role to develop international arbitration. Um, he then identified uh, what other people have identified throughout these years, uh, which is perhaps the most known problem of international arbitration, which was cost and efficiency. But it was interesting to me to see that back in 2001, uh, he had already identified uh, two areas where institutions should be uh, developing, uh, which was very much related to the issue of, of costs and access to the international arbitration system. One which was uh, what we know today as the emergency arbitrator uh, procedure, and the second one, which is the expedited arbitration procedure. In fact, in his lectures in 2001, he had already identified that the expedited procedure that uh, at the time was, had been designed by WIPO uh, was actually the way to go uh, if certain international arbitration institutions wanted to make uh, a development in that respect. Uh, he noted that some efforts that had been made by the ICC at the time uh, with the pre-arbitral referee rules and uh, some sort of called fast-track arbitration that the ICC had created at the time uh, ha were not successful and that further uh, emphasis had to be made in that, uh, in that sense. And we can see today that every single international arbitration institution uh, today has expedited procedure and has emergency arbitrator uh, rules. So that was, again, very uh, visionary uh, of his part. The last uh, initiative that he thought of uh, was not identified in the, in the Lauder Park series, but came about because of an experience he had in one ICC case, uh, which I happened to be the counsel in charge of. Um, it was a case seated in Mexico, an ICC arbitration seated in Mexico. Following a partial award, the losing party decided to pursue uh, and initiate a criminal action against uh, the members of the arbitral tribunal. And I remember how he was uh, undeterred to continue the case. Uh, he believed that his role as arbitrator was sacrosanct, uh, that the institution had appointed him uh, to take this dispute to the end, and he was not afraid. He hired lawyers in Mexico, and he decided to uh, move on with the arbitration. And so, uh, eventually, those uh, actions were dismissed, and the case actually was settled. Um, and uh, he faced that with the conviction where that he faced in other uh, situations. And we all know that uh, Orrego Vicuña faced challenges uh, of another nature in other cases. I mean, he was challenged as an arbitrator many times in commercial and investment cases. And again, I remember a particular case, another ICC case, uh, seated in a South American country, uh, which where he faced a very, very serious challenge. There were serious allegations. Even his Chilean nationality uh, was uh, a ground, one of the grounds that was raised uh, for his challenge. And even then, when uh, he had received a very uh, accusatory um, 
things that were said against him, uh, he was undeterred. He decided to answer the challenge. Um, and he called me and said, look, I know that the best thing for this case is that I step down, given the tone of the challenge. I will do so, but I want the ICC to decide on the challenge first. Uh, and I said, you know that I cannot guarantee you what the ICC court is going to decide. It may well actually accept the challenge. He says, I don't care. This is the system. These are the rules of the game, and I abide by them. And so the challenge went to the ICC. The ICC dismissed the challenge, and then he stepped down for the good of the case. And that is someone that actually not only believes in the system, uh, but that uh, uh, respects the system, and uh, that's something that I learned and that I appreciate uh, very much uh, of his work as an arbitrator. Uh, I would like to conclude by uh, perhaps repeating something that has already been said, and I think that perhaps his uh, greater legacy is that uh, he was a kind and a generous uh, man. He was accessible, uh, he was generous with his time and generous with his knowledge. I was very young when I met uh, Francisco Orrego Vicuña, I ne and I never felt that my age was an obstacle to have access to him. And I cannot say that about uh, many other people <laughs> in the field. Uh, but, uh, and I believe that I am probably among the youngest people that have spoken here today. Uh, and when you see people from all generations basically uh, agreeing and saying the same things about uh, someone, you realize that uh, he was indeed a great man. And that, I think, is the greatest legacy, and I will forever be grateful for him for that. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Does anyone want to add a statement or make a comment? Yes. Can you stand up? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? May I conclude on a personal note? We spoke of Cato's intellectual brilliance and encyclopedic knowledge. He had an astute legal mind, an exceptional ability to identify issues, and a keen sensitivity to politics. He had the wisdom of a consummate diplomat and an academic's philosophical turn of mind. But all these talents seem pale beside his immense human qualities. He was a true gentleman with much kindness and humility. He was unfailingly courteous and treated everyone with equal warmth. Whenever he entered an office, he would address everyone present, including receptionists and security staff, with the same friendly regard and gentle sense of humor. He was devoted to his family, remained loyal to his friends, always ready to assist, advise, and to mentor young talent. He was the most gracious person by nature, always ready to forgive his critics. One of Cato's passions was reading books of spiritual wisdom. He enjoyed Tagore's poetry, 
among others. One day he read the book, The Prophet, by my compatriot Khalil Gibran. I remember him referring with praise on several occasions to this book of poetic prose that recounts the story of a prophet who lived for many years in the imaginary city of Orphalese and was about to board a ship that would carry him home. I imagine that Cato posed when reading the following excerpts from the prophet. Then he descended the steps of the temple and all the people followed him. And he reached his ship and stood upon the deck. And facing the people again, he raised his voice and said, people of Orphalis, the wind bid bids me leave you. Less hasty am I than the wind, yet I must go. We wanderers ever seeking the lonelier way begin no day where we have ended another day and no sunrise finds us where sunset left us. Even while the earth sleeps, we travel. We are the seeds of the tenacious plant and it is in our ripeness and our fullness of heart that we are given to the wind and are scattered. On behalf of my distinguished colleagues on this panel, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I hope that we were successful in expressing some of our esteem and respect for our late friend and colleague, Professor Francisco Orego Vicunia. We now leave the floor to Dr. Klein Hester Camp for his concluding remarks. Thank you. Very well. I think I cannot really add anything to that conclusion. That was perfect. I uh, will not revise the rich topics that we've seen today, the excellent presentations and very thought provoking and also humorous contributions, which I think are most appropriate in this context. I would like to thank everyone for being here. I would like to thank the Orego family for coming and, and celebrating with us here uh, to the ambassadors. Uh, for helping also in making this possible. LSE is very proud of its alumnus, uh, Francisco Rego Vicuña. Um, many people have worked in the backgrounds. They really deserve a big round of applause, just as all everyone who has contributed, and I thank you for being here. Oh, yes, and uh, with all of that I forgot, very practically, we really hope you can stay for another little moment of having a drink with us, just going down the stairs that you will find next to the exit here, down to the senior common room of the academics of LSE, uh, for a small reception. Thank you very much. Thank you very